This is the Cis Lunar Experience, Episode 4. I'm your host, J. Vincent Maroli. Today, we're going to be talking about the rising power and threat of the Chinese Communist Party and their ambitions in space. The supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting, strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. The whole secret lies in confusing the enemy so that he cannot fathom our real intent. Sun Tzu, The Art of War, 470 BC. The rise of the Chinese Communist Party is a gargantuan threat to those who seek liberty and freedom in any nation. Their aims, as will be discussed on this show and in future episodes, are encompassing and may quickly outstrip the capabilities of all other spacefaring nations. To educate us on this matter today, we have the privilege of welcoming Stephen Quast on the show. He's a combat leader, retired three-star lieutenant general in the Air Force. He's received countless awards while in service to this great nation, such as the Defense Superior Service Medal, Legion of Merit with Oak Leaf Cluster, Distinguished Flying Cross, and many more. While in active duty, he served as the military aide to the Vice President of the United States, Commander of the 455th Air Expeditionary Wing in Bagram, Afghanistan, and Deputy Director for Politico-Military Affairs for Europe, NATO, and Russia on the Joint Staff at the Pentagon. He is a lecturer at the Hillsdale College and is the president of Genesis Systems, a cutting edge company bringing clean water to every man, woman, and child on earth. Please welcome Stephen Quast. Well, three, two, one, let's get to it. Okay. <sighs> Lieutenant General, retired, mm -hmm. Stephen Quast. Pleasure, thanks for coming on the show. Well, thank you for telling the story. Absolutely. Really exciting. Um, so I, I think a, a good way to have this show go is you know, I first met you through the foreword um, of this awesome book, Space Power Ascendant. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe we can, we can touch on that guy, just on that forward of a general overview of what's to come. Then let's, let's jump back in time and sort of hear some of your own trajectory in the military, what you did with them, how space got involved. Uh, and then that'll probably bring us up towards current day and then moving forwards on either where, you know, some hopes and dreams for where the U S could go or where it could not, depending on the actions that we take. Uh, and we can also get into, I know you said you, you've just started a company down here, uh, in, in Florida. So, there's, there's a whole host of things that we can talk about, um, but I think that, that'd be a good framework for us to kind of go with the rest of the show. All right. Well, I look forward to that. Uh, and again, this company was uh, started by uh, the Stuckenbergs, and uh, I happen to be the president and chief global officer for the company. But uh, that, um, that technology is actually linked to space as well, and we can get into that. But essentially, it will be the water management system mm. that uh, space travelers will use to manage the beauty, the protection uh, from radiation, and the uh, health of uh, human beings traveling in space. So, so, okay, wait, water is managing radiation. Because I think it's NASA says you're supposed to be in space for like 200 days or something, and then you reach your limited dose of radiation with current levels. Well, that's assuming you don't have what I'm talking about. In right. other words, 
uh, Mother Earth has been traveling around the sun in space <laughs> as a spaceship for many, many, many years. Yep. And uh, the same amount of water is on the planet. Uh, and uh, we are okay with the radiation levels. Building a spacecraft mm. that has the same radiation levels as Earth, meaning replicating or the biomimicry of Earth mm. in space travel with a water management system uh, that has an engine just like the Earth does. And the water management uh, mission, uh, engine of the Earth is the ocean, and it's a liquid desiccant system. And uh, we've recreated that process. Uh, so that, but that's a whole other conversation yeah. we can get into. But the uh, the beauty is, Mother Nature has already designed the perfect spacecraft, and it's called Mother Earth. <laughs> and we know how to replicate that in every way, from the plants to the humidity in the air to the management of the water. Oh. So it's really it, exciting. With, without getting, I guess, too. I mean, I mean, we're here. So, is there a size constraint? No, for you that can, type of system. You, you can build it uh, as small or as large as you need for the amount of water you need to transfer. Fascinating. Uh, so the name of the company is Genesis Systems, and it uh, right now we are solving the terrestrial problem because we need to build mm -hmm. the, the technology and the profit to solve problems people have on yeah. planet Earth. Uh, you know, fifty percent of illnesses is due to a lack of clean water. 6,000 children die every day due to, due to lack of water. I mean, for Americans, yeah. we don't, don't even fathom that. But I grew up in an African tribe, and so I mm. grew up without uh, access to water as a, as a right, if you will. It was always a struggle. And, uh, yeah. But for Americans, it, it would be like watching 12 747s hmm. filled with our children crashing to the earth every day and all of them perishing and not doing anything about it. So this company was founded to do something about that. Nice. But what was fascinating is that as a engineers took a look at how Mother Nature did it, which is usually the most elegant solution, we discovered that uh, this water management system that Mother Earth uses to keep enough rain and water on the planet mm -hmm. is the ideal system for space travel because the water protects you in one state, it humidifies the air in another state, it creates water for your plants and animals in another state, and it can move between those states and you never lose it. It always just uh, is perfectly sustainable forever. Just a closed loop cycle right yep. there. That's right. I've, I've had that uh, conversation with some, some space people on LinkedIn or elsewhere. Anytime people talk about like, you know, we're leaving space trash, we're going to pollute Mars, we're going to pollute such and such. It's like we are very incentivized in space to have full life cycle systems. That's right. for Absolutely everything. Yeah, so uh, you know that this is one of the actual points that uh, we should touch on today, and that is that uh, the human race now understands how important it is to be the stewards of the environment we're in. Yeah. And um, as we take this step into space, uh, we need to do it differently than we've done all the other steps of humanity as we populated the Earth because we did not do it in this, this sustainable way. We did not do it in a way that was kind to all people, respected all people, yeah. all cultures, all economies. And uh, we have the chance as a human race to do this properly in space. But it's gonna take a leader that's willing to invest in the, um, the rules of the road hmm. so that we don't pollute, we don't destroy, and we beautify and we sustain as we go. I love that the the addition there of of beauty, yeah. Because uh, if we just expand, what we're in these tiny little eggs that you know have only white walls and such and such, it's going to be a pretty dark and depressing time period. And doesn't have to be. In fact, when yeah. we're done with this, I'll show you a picture. We uh, okay. had an artist do a rendering of what a Genesis Systems um, spacecraft would look like with the blue skies, clouds, uh, a mother holding her baby in a field of flowers with stream and animals running around, uh, perfectly protected from radiation in space at 1G, uh, traveling uh, as far as they want, uh, generation after generation. All you have to do is tell me how many people you want to sustain, okay. and I'll tell you how much dirt and how much water you need. And with only the sun's energy, yeah. You can have sustainable, uh, infinite uh, travel, just like Mother Earth. It travels infinitely with the same amount of earth and water. 
So, so is the shape of these spaceship? Is it like O'Neill colony sort it's, of it's, cylinders? It's like a hula hoop. Hula hoop. Think, think of okay. a hula hoop that's rotating. So it's one G. Okay. And so just like if you walk on the planet here, if you walk in the same direction far enough, you come to the same point because you're just walking around the Earth and uh, you're on a ball. But uh, the hula hoop, if you mm. walk, you're walking a little bit uphill. It doesn't look like uphill because it's large, but uh, yeah. you keep walking. You're feeling 1G. Uh, everything feels like it's upright. But eventually, you'll get back to the same spot you started. Okay. And it's, it's 1G because it's, it's large rotating. enough to be rotating. Well, it's not the size. Uh, it, it, the larger it is, uh, you know, so the rotation is dependent on the radius. Right. Or the diameter. Yeah, and that's from... I've had people talk to me about like, you know, why don't we have artificial gravity in space yet? Yeah, we do. We, we can. It's just that uh, uh, the uh, it's like the dominoes. One one domino has to fall to make the other one affordable. Yeah. So when we can actually construct in space with mm -hmm. materials from space, like any asteroid, because the asteroids are made of the same stuff as Mother Earth, yeah. when we can do that and we don't have to uh, endure the high cost of lifting everything out of the gravity well, Hmm. then you will be able to build spaceships that do exactly that affordably and the business case will close and that chapter will be closed. And and we can go into the next generation with halo rings of, of, of ships. That's, yes. that's what I'm picking up on. Yeah, that's right. All right. Fantastic. Um, so, so, so many things here. How does someone that grew up in an African tribe that doesn't have access to water leave that situation get connected to the U.S., get connected to the Air Force, travel up the ranks to Lieutenant General, way, way up there, and also have a deep passion for space. Like, walk us through that, because that's quite the, the story. Well, it uh, there's, there's really only one driving uh, motivator, and that is uh, this love for people. Hmm. And uh, so... That love for people that I got to see in my parents as missionaries, uh, taking care of this African tribe. And then when my father got ill and we had to come back to America, taking a look at this constitution and how mm. that was essentially embracing the love of people, pursuing happiness um, in ways that gave them security and prosperity and health. Mm. Uh, and I wanted to defend that. I wanted to defend yeah. that. And then at the Air Force Academy, as I was studying astronautical engineering and studying space, I, uh, I read many great visionaries before me that uh, showed me that space is the, the great opportunity for humanity to not only solve the problems we have created on planet Earth, hmm. but allow us uh, the ability to expand our knowledge and our opportunities as a human race uh, to uh, extend into the heavens. It, uh, mm -hmm. And so it's, it's because the generosity and kindness that can happen when humanity has uh, the ability to stretch out and uh, not uh, crowd themselves um, is, is, again, rooted in that same kindness to people yeah. where um, uh, it, uh, space is our great savior coming hmm. um, to the human race. And uh, most of those that grew up in the industrial age may not recognize that, but uh, a lot of us do, and we cannot wait for it to get here. I love that. Yeah, I've, I've shared with a few other people that they've been describing how information revolutions tend to take place first, but following that, there's industrial revolutions. And over the course of human history, there's been a bit of delay but you know, you can think of the first information revolution as the printing press, and all of a sudden we can we can print books, and now people can read, and it's not just for the monks, etc. Flash forward about 250, 300 years, took a while to educate Europe, and and yeah, China had had one a printing press before, um, but you know now the common man can can read manuals and such and such, and so now we have this industrial revolution take place in London and England. Flash forward a couple, another hundred years or so over in America, and both the discovery of, you know, electricity, uh, the, the harnessing of that, I guess, is maybe a better way to say mm -hmm. it, uh, as well as the use of the telegraph. 
really started just exploding the U.S.'s industrial capability. And then, you know, we started mass producing. At that point, it was just iron. And then Andrew Carnegie and a couple others figured out, oh, the Bessemer principle. Now we can make just crap tons of steel yeah. and just give it. And we expanded. And then yet again, in the 50s, 60s, we got rid of the vacuum tube and figured out how to make the transistor. And the internet came out of that magic and you know <clears throat> there, there's been all these advances and we look towards going to space for for people that are outside of the industry right i i can sit here and totally visualize space as the fourth industrial revolution um how do you paint how do you connect the dots for people that just say i mean, I mean sure maybe i use it in my Domino's app but it, it just doesn't really connect with them that there's really untold opportunities, resources up there. Okay, well, um, what I'll do is I'll use a, uh, an example that everybody is familiar with to paint the picture of what this could mean. Um, it, it, would, it would be like if we were sitting here in 1890 hmm. and you were trying to explain to a farmer who uh, lights his house with candles, heats his house with a pot belly stove and wood fire, Hmm. and uh, transports himself on his horse to get places. If you were trying to describe electricity and uh, the automobile, uh, it would be hard to imagine. But, uh, but there are some examples that can help people understand the transformational power of what space can do for the human race. Hmm. And I'll give you um, a couple of them, and we, we can go into more if you'd like. Sure. But let's take one right now. And it really comes down to the difference between a linear model and a networked model. And mm. uh, okay. w without getting into those terms, because uh, I'll just use a simple example. Um, GPS. Wherever you're at with your smart device, you mm -hmm. pretty much can go anywhere you want as long as you have an address because you have a network of satellites that allow you to see where you're at and then uh, with supercomputing on your smart device, it can tell you which turn you need to make, make next in order to get to where you want it to go. Mm -hmm. um, that, um, that is the power of a network. Instead of a map, a linear map that you have to carry with you and look up, um, you have supercomputing help you uh, go anywhere you want and you don't have to do the work. Uh, other things are doing the work for you. Mm -hmm. Well, now let's think about... Um, Communication. I'll use communication and uh, energy as okay. the two transformational things will happen when space is industrialized in a responsible, sustainable way. And I am going to add those two terms every time I do this because yeah. there are a lot of people afraid that uh, industrializing space will look like the settling of the wild, wild west, which was not mm. always a pretty story. Yeah. Uh, again, and this is where humanity has learned some things, and we have a chance to do it right, and uh, we, we must, if we have leadership that helps us guide in there. But let's take um, communication. Hmm. Right now, um, in America, we have about 600,000 cell towers so that you can have four bars on your LTE or yeah. 5G phone. Except when you're driving from, from Tampa to, to That's Lakewood. Right. Then when it, you're driving through the green swamp in Florida, you have zero dink. service. Yeah. And, uh, and it's because um, the business case just hasn't closed to build um, uh, two million cell towers in America to cover every nook and cranny because you need line of sight, meaning you have to be yeah. able to, the cell tower has to, those wavelengths have to reach your phone. And if there's a mountain in the way, it matters. Mm -hmm. So um, instead of, um, w so now let's t talk about that communication in space. If, um, if, it, if we've invested in 600,000 cell towers in America and the business case closed on that, with just a handful of satellites and less capital investment, you can have a constellation where your cell phone thinks every satellite is a cell tower <laughs> and you have infinite communication. You have four bars even in the deepest valley of the Grand Canyon hmm. because the satellites They're are always a constellation there. always above you. As long as you can see the sky, yeah. you have four bars. There is a difference in the difference between a linear system where you have cell towers that have to be built every hilltop to get to every customer 
which is linear, yeah, yeah, um, and a high capital investment versus a network system with a small investment in capital, you now can uh, have coverage everywhere on the planet. Hmm. It's cheaper and it's more useful to the customer. So one example, and again, uh, mm -hmm. I'll make a caveat here. I intentionally take zero money from any space company hmm. so that I can talk to Congress and I can talk to people without anybody uh, ever thinking that there's an agenda there. Nice. So if I mention a company, it's not because they pay me. The only company that pays me is Genesis Systems because I'm its president right. and I am dedicated and loyal to that company and that company alone. But it doesn't mean I can't help yeah. the country see the opportunity for America and for the humanity if America is willing to lead. I love that. And, and, and just to jump in there real yeah. quick, that's one of the things I found about this industry is that it's funny that it's both a people call it the wild west because there's the, the legislation, the rule of law, barely any of it's been written. Yeah. And yet, you know, there aren't indigenous people that are up in space not that I've met. Um, and there's a massive, at least within the U S and I haven't had a ton of exposure to our, you know, our allies outside, but within the U S there's a massive amount of cooperation of maybe wild West, but it's blue ocean. Let's help each other out sort of thing. This is a really important cause. True. And I love that. I mean, it, it, yeah. it reveals that there are more good people in this world than there are people that would want to um, control other people or um, um, steal from them or um, take advantage of them in ways that are not moral and kind and good. Yeah. So that's very encouraging. But um, if you don't have rule of law, eventually somebody will come along that does not have the moral scruples to do yeah. what's right because it is right. And if you don't have a mechanism to hold them accountable and to stop them, uh, they can run amok. They can, they can run wild and do a lot of harm to a lot of people. And there is life out there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so uh, no matter how it takes form, we as a human race need to be respectful of this environment and space. Um, just as if human beings were out there, uh, there is life out there. We just yeah. don't know what it looks like. Fair enough. And uh, we need to be very careful to do, do this right. So I just talked about communication as an example. Mm -hmm. If we were, you know, we, we are talking to people that are used to cell towers now and smartphones. And uh, all you have to do is to take a look at uh, the company called uh, Link. So Link is a company. Yeah. It was founded by Charles Miller, <laughs> and they have proven, and they have satellites airborne, and they're trying to apply it to Ukraine right now, where mm. you don't need a different cell phone. You use your current smart device, and it already thinks that satellite is a cell tower, and yeah. it talks to it just like it would a cell tower. Yeah. And so there is an example of a space company that has taken advantage of this network nature of a space constellation, Mm -hmm. to do something useful and novel, meaning this is different. Uh, but it, 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 it uplifts the current investment. You don't have to go out and buy a new phone. The phone you have will work. And now if you are with Link, mm -hmm. you have four bars everywhere on the planet. Yeah, and it, it just turns it into a satellite phone. Right. Yeah. With, you know, it's so it, it's brilliant. And this is what you're looking at in the, the space industrial base. You are looking at companies that are doing this very thing. Hmm. Uh, and uh, there's a whole host of them. It's not just the big ones that were working on transportation with reusability, such as Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. Sure. These, are, um, these are the geniuses of our age, along with Bezos and Musk, uh, that are... Um, laying down the technologies and the businesses hmm. that will set the table for uh, the rise of the human race hmm. to uh, embrace the beauty of space to solve our problems and expand our horizons and our opportunities. I love that. That's, that's well said. Uh, you know, if we jump back for a second to the, uh, you know, the global, the, the environmental aspect of all of this, there's a stat I read a while ago, I think it was from Pew Research or, or one of those very reputable groups that as soon as you get someone's annual adjusted income above, like, it was so low. It was like $6,000 a year, right, equivalent. As soon as it gets above that, they suddenly care a little bit more about the environment. Like, they're they're more prone to not just burn fecal matter in the backyard to heat such and such, which is terrible for the environment. But 
when you're in abject poverty and you have no idea if you're going to be able to feed, you know, if two of your nine children are going to live, I really don't care about the earth, right? I'm trying to get some of my kids to, to not die. And so the idea of, I, I really think the, the leverage point that space has to offer is like, no, 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 no. It, it's going to allow technology and economic benefit to really distribute down to a lot of people that would not have access to this otherwise. And that, that satellite example for phones, that's, that's a perfect example. So I started with that one, and, and you're right about the, uh, you know, the hierarchy of priorities. You know, if you right. have a choice, does your son or daughter live, or do you uh, not pollute the earth? You'll, they, may, they do care about the earth, yeah. but it's about priorities. And once that priority is taken care of, then they'll take care of the other one. So, but yeah. I started with communication in this example to help mm -hmm. people understand how dramatically space can solve our problems as a human race. Because it goes back to a point you made, and that is these, these revolutions start with information. Okay, yeah. so when you can do more than just have a printing press where people have access to books, but rather hmm. everybody can have a um, smart device in their pocket and have access to the world's knowledge, even in the Hindu Kush or in the bottom of uh, the Congo Delta, um, where there is no infrastructure, there are no cell towers. When all of those people can now reach information, mm -hmm. just watch what will happen to the human race in, in both good ways and ways we have to be careful of. So, mm. the, the, so the second example um, yeah. follows the communication because if you follow these journeys in history from the agrarian age to the scientific age, the information or to the industrial age and now the information age, um, they start with information mm -hmm. and then it quickly moves to energy. Okay. Okay. And so I'll give you an energy example. And this goes back to Tesla and Edison. When electricity Classics. was first, yes, when we, the first conversations were happening. And most people may not be deeply familiar with that story, but it's a story worth looking back on because almost every uh, major scientist will tell you that Tesla's idea of energy um, delivery was superior. Hmm. And it was a beamed energy that is safe for humans, but it, it was beamed energy. And Edison's was a wire. Yeah. And the only reason why Edison won out over Tesla is because he was better at marketing, mm -hmm. uh, but he was. Uh, but the marketing came along with a business case, meaning they did not yet know how to charge a customer if the customer could receive waves of energy to charge their devices. Yeah. But an electrical wire could have a meter on it and you could actually charge people. Now we figured that out. You get satellite radio and we mm. know how to charge you even <laughs> when you're just receiving <laughs> waves of energy from space. Okay, yeah, yeah. So now if you employ Tesla's idea of a uh, essentially radio waves okay. that allow okay. your device to absorb energy. Now you don't need plugs in your wall. You don't need wires going to homes. You can have a constellation of satellites that can beam energy to the market of hum the human race in ways that are safe and effective, meaning that the radiation is less than what you would get from the sun hmm. going out or even from you know FM and AM radio. We don't worry that FM and AM radio waves are gonna cause cancer or are going to be problematic. Hmm. But we have developed devices around us that require this high intensity energy that is predicated on Edison's model hmm. of a, uh, a wire coming to your house with high voltage. Yeah. And, uh, and so we all have learned how to be careful to not burn down our houses or put plugs in the wall so your kids don't go put their finger in the socket, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to be that way. The, there are ways of building devices that can absorb energy in a way that is safe and effective, and you can use beamed energy to deliver that. So, so to clarify here, like, so, you know, Apple, I've, I've got all their products pretty much, right? And they've got the wireless charging. Mm-hmm and I set the phone on top of the little device 
but it's not charging until it's physically on there. Mm -hmm. And then it, without wires, it somehow engineers in the comments will tell me, you know, it, it transmits yeah. power up through there. That has to be like very, very close. Yeah. That, so that's a different technique. Okay. Um, but it, it does reveal the fact that you don't need a physical connection in order to charge something. Yeah. But you're charging devices that are built to work on high intensity energy you know, your smart devices. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have not built devices that are designed to work off of low intensity energy. It can be done. It's just the market hasn't closed. So I'll give you an example. Right now, okay, okay. Uh, what, um, what uh, the U.S. and China and other uh, nations are uh, prototyping is a, a solar a satellite that's collecting solar energy from the sun, mm -hmm. converting it into radio waves, and those radio waves are coming down to Earth. And what they're doing right now is they're porting that into the electrical plant that they're then bringing the energy to your home through a wire. Yeah, but yeah. that that's a half step, meaning that's a step where you're taking advantage of the current infrastructure because nobody's going to go out and build a new home with all devices that are built for a different kind of energy delivery. Sure. Had we taken, had we taken Tesla's idea when he first was delivering it, yeah. we may not have any power wires right now, but again, they couldn't figure out how to charge a customer yeah. and uh, the marketing of Edison was superior on every level. Right. And he was, I, I, I love learning about Tesla in, in a sense, he was almost too idealistic where he's like, let's just give power to everyone. Right. Awesome. Very altruistic. Died a pauper, unfortunately. Yeah, that's right. And that's so sad because he was brilliant. Well, he's not the only example of the Wright brothers that invented the airplane. Yeah. They died paupers and bitter because their patent was stolen by the government. Uh, it was built by other companies. Uh, they went to court and they did not have the lawyers. And uh, so it, it's a very sad story in the human race where I was not aware of that. greed and, um, and uh, um, a sense of urgency sometimes uh, cloaks greed. <laughs> um, but uh, ultimately, uh, back to this idea of how space can transform the human race. Yeah. If space can give us ubiquitous communication where everybody has access to the world's knowledge, and space can give us affordable energy that can energize any device anywhere on the planet without the need for infrastructure. You don't need power plants. You don't need uh, wires. You, you, um, think about what that will do for the human condition, meaning lifting people out of poverty. Yeah. Because with abundant energy and communication, you can uh, create the water you need. You can create the food you need and you can do it at affordable price points. This is what is coming our way. Space will solve world hunger. Space will solve the 50% of people that uh, are ill because of a lack of clean water. Space will take people out of poverty in a way that even the industrial age was not able to do. Yeah, like as, as you describe that, even being someone deep in the industry and like I've there's a portion of me that like deeply believes you and wants that to take place. And the other part of me is like, I feel like the farmer who rides a horse yeah. <laughs> who's trying to have, give, give me a better horse, give me cheaper candles right, and right. give me more wood and I'll be just fine. I'll be fine. It'll be okay. Cause he can't envision the gas stations, the roads, no. the auto repair shops. Uh, he can't envision the wires and the power plants delivering energy to his home through electricity. Let alone, YouTube and smartphones, right. like just not compatible. And so these journeys have a temporal dimension to them, meaning they take time. Uh, it, there's two components of the time it takes. The first is the mindset mm. that people need to get used to something new because we as a human race tend to be stubborn and we tend to like the, you know, the way things are. Yep. Change is hard. It's scary. Mm -hmm. And the second is these journeys take time because you struggle through the, um, you know, the wrinkling out all the rough edges or, mm. you know, ironing out all the rough edges, really. Uh, so electricity, when it first came, uh, this is, again, another historical point that kind of puts it in perspective. Um, the first hotels that had electricity, mm. um, the customers were so afraid that they had to actually hire employees to turn on the light switch because the customers would not touch the switch because they thought they would be electrocuted. 
Wow. Yeah. So there's a hotel up there in St. Augustine, one of the oldest cities in America. Yeah. Um, and that's, uh, you know, you if you take a tour of their museum and or that old hotel that is now the college up there. Okay. Um, you know, this is one of the stories where they'll show you one of the, because it was one of the first um, hotels that had electricity hmm. and they had an entire staff that was just paid to turn on the lights for the customers and turn them off and turn them off yeah so this gives you a sense for how hard it is for people to um, usher in a new idea and without being afraid of it so yeah. for example um, when we start beaming energy to devices people will cry bloody murder it's going to cause cancer it's going to yeah. uh, destroy the ecosystem it's going to you know kill plants and animals um even when there's no science to yeah and there's there is um literally millions of years of all the plants and animals living in health hmm. with a much higher dose of radiation that comes from sunshine <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we're talking about falls well below the threshold of sunshine. Hmm. Yet, because it's new and because it's different and because it will threaten an entire revenue stream of people that are getting rich on high intensity energy hmm. and on all the devices built around electricity delivered through high intensity wires, it will take a long time for business to adapt to something new. Hmm. But it goes back to your point that everybody loves the earth and recognizes they need to take care of the earth. Even the people below that threshold of income you were talking about that yeah. have to first feed their children before they can care about a non-polluted street or air. Sure. There is something visceral in us that recognizes that if we do not take care of our environment, that will eventually kill us. And, um, and, and so business people will start understanding how to create businesses that deliver Hmm. communication and energy using space as the network platform that allows it to be done for less capital investment mm -hmm. and less cost per packet of information and packet of energy yeah. and do it sustainably where it's safer for human beings. If you added up all of the people that die because of electricity in the form it is now, hmm. uh, you start looking at the facts clearly that a new model for energy delivery can be safer and cheaper than the mm -hmm. current, but because you are disrupting all the old. So it's like, uh, it's like putting the horse industry out of business or, yeah. or the sail making industry out of business when you went to steam power and oil power, um, deep sea navigation, yeah. or, um, you know, every one, uh, candle, the candle industry that went, uh, you know, only, uh, back in the day, uh, only, Poor people had candles when electricity was first in. Now only rich people have candles because <laughs> yeah. it's such, you know, it's kind of a luxury. Right, right. Uh, so it's amazing how the business mind of great human beings mm -hmm. will be able to flip the paradigm over time. But it yeah. takes time, and they're fighting fear of change. It takes time. It takes fighting that. It it takes good public relations media. Yeah. Right. That's one of the things that you know a lot of people in this industry have realized. It's like okay, we got to do a better job of talking to people that aren't in space and telling them stories like what you just told us. Cause the, I'll, I'll, I'll pull a random number, you know, 70, 80% of the U S population, whatever it is, that's a made up number, but a large percentage of it. When they think about space, they think of maybe, you know, the, uh, the Mars Rover headline that, Oh, human trash is on Mars. And it was, it was the heat blanket from the rover, and it was just a catchy little title to get them. But probably most of them just think of space as, that's where billionaires go to play with their toys. That's yeah. never for me. Right. Well, this, uh, this goes back to information. You know, when, when you it. can start, and this, this is why your podcast is so important, hmm. that it, um, it does not, these kind of transformational uh, relationships between humanity and uh, communication, energy, water, mm -hmm. you know, some of these key things, food. Yeah. When you are uh, making such a large change, it can't be done in sound bites. 
Hmm. Because what happens then is people that have a political agenda or a financial agenda hijack the uh, talking points or the narrative, and people believe what they want to believe, and they they yeah. and they buy into their fears more quickly then they will be willing to open their mind to change. Yeah. So this podcast is important because it does take time to unpack this conversation and you can't do it in a soundbite. Well, I appreciate that. So, so digging into that, right? So power, trying to overcome the fear aspect of what will a, a, new, a new paradigm, a new world of power distribution look like? I think one way to ease us into that would be to prove out the technology of sp of space companies to space companies mm -hmm. transmitting that power because it's there are, can't be wires in space right. they're pretty you know you can't yeah. build that kind of infrastructure you can build other types um and then once it's proven out there that it's cost effective that it's safe that it's x y and z then maybe it works its way down into the terrestrial is that how you see it going well, or something else? Uh, well, China is already beaming power from space down, and so are we, you know, the Air Force Research Lab. Uh, so th these uh, oh. prototypes are happening right okay. now. Okay, prototypes. Yeah, so uh, you can you can study that and take a look at it and see that it's safe, it's effective. Yeah. Uh, and as business leaders uh, um, turn it into a business case where it's affordable to markets, it will start becoming a part of more and more markets. Hmm. Uh, but uh, this is how innovation works. And to try to predict how it will unfold is always a fool's errand, just like predicting the future. Yeah. Um, all you can do is allow the business environment, the freedom, and this goes back hmm. to the free market, yeah. the freedom to try and tinker and play with things. But we also have to have a tolerance as a human race. If, if we ran for the hills every time an airplane crashed back in the teens, 20s, and 30s, we would never have air transportation. But look at it now, where it is the safest form of transportation. By far. And if we were looking at actual facts, um, nobody would get in their car and drive because the <laughs> odds of you getting hurt in your car are far, far greater than the odds of you getting hurt by a virus <laughs> or, um, or you know, a, uh, an airplane yeah. uh, or um, a fire in your home. Hmm. It... Uh, so it, it, but again, this gets back to telling these stories and we as a, as a human race and in America, we need to continue telling ourselves these stories that the way we make progress mm -hmm. to have sustainable solutions of those things that are essential, food, water, shelter, energy, information, mm -hmm. uh, healthcare, transportation, uh, the way to move to a more sustainable, responsible relationship with these things in the human race is to talk about them mm -hmm. and to pay attention to the policies of our government and to support the business people that are delivering useful and novel things that abide by these things we believe in, these, these values mm -hmm. of like sustainability and no pollution. Yeah. And, and that's one reason why uh, I'm the president of this company, Genesis Systems, because our our water technology can use just the sun and the earth to mm. create abundant water with no pollution because it mimics mother nature and yeah. the ocean. And, um, and so this is where um, even the average citizen that um, does not really think about space mm -hmm. can just uh, realize that they have a role to play in moving humanity forward. Mm. And if they, talk about these things, if they use this information that's right at their fingertips to study and collaborate, mm -hmm. and if they, uh, if they encourage their government to allow uh, free will yeah. for companies to make choices, uh, to try new things, uh, then we will be wildly successful as a human race. But sometimes what happens is people are so afraid and they put safety sometimes mm. above um, ushering in sustainable solutions. Yeah. That uh, safety, uh, you know, if you were perfectly safe, you would never get out of bed and you would never drive a car. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, we tend to not fear that because we do it so much and we just accept the carnage that happens on the roadways every day. So this, this goes back to space, is that for people to keep an open mind, mm -hmm. to realize that some... 
amazingly great things are happening Mm -hmm. and that it will usher in a new era of the human race, uplifting the human condition and pulling people out of poverty in a way that has never been possible before. Mm -hmm. That is, that's keeping your eye on the right ball. And, yeah. and not being afraid of fear mongers saying the spaceship will crash. Yeah. Well, and, and that's such an, that's such a more palatable, optimistic, joy filled discussion. Whereas if you look at the history of space travel, I feel like a lot of that optimism has been confined to the sci-fi realm. And like, if, if you look at the, the Apollo program and beforehand, it was, Beat the Russians, beat the Russians, beat the Russians, beat the Russians. Now there were there was good reasons to beat the Russians, but it was very fear based. In my you know, yeah. twenty five, I wasn't around back then, but you know, by studying history, and the result of that is you know we moved, we we pushed into high gear, we made action steps take place, and as soon as we beat the Russians we just kind of stopped. Yeah. We, 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 we slowed down dramatically because that fear element had disappeared. There's so much of that today. And like, there's, there's aspects that we kind of should be afraid of. There's some fear out there when, when we deal with China and we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but I f- feel like if we just focus on that, then it's just, we're just adding to the clickbait which there's a whole bunch of already. We don't need more of that. Right. Well, you know, my uh, uh, welcome to human nature, sadly. You know, because, you know, as a, when people think about the military, the, the military's job is to never have to fight because you were yeah. clever enough in your strategy to never have to use force. Hmm. And so in order to be good at national security, you have to study three things. One is human hmm. nature. Two is the nature of uh, power, and uh, because uh, and 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 the role technology plays in power politics, and the third is uh, studying uh, culture, hmm. and understanding uh, the um, uh, the uh, strategies that revolve around cultural paradigms, because miscommunication is at the core of so much of the violence and carnage in the world. And um, so when you study human nature, your point is exactly right. People tend to be motivated with more um, uh, animation (laughs) and uh, and, uh, willingness to, to push hard when they're afraid. Yeah. Fear is a great motivator, but it's an unfortunate motivator because it oftentimes will overshoot or it will um, it will create outcomes that are not kind to other people. And so uh, when I go back to the values of this country where Mm -hmm. we respect every human being, no matter who they are, where they came from, what food they eat, what clothes they wear or what they believe, you respect every human being equally. All of us are equally loved by God. Every one of us has a mother that loves us and would die for us and a Mm -hmm. father that would protect us. Um, And uh, hopefully, yeah, hopefully the um, the, at least that's what we strive for. But the human condition is not perfect. Yeah. And so when we talk about this relation, this this journey into space, we can talk about uh, fear but I think it's important to not necessarily use the word fear, but talk about mm. the pattern of uh, civilizations trying to dominate one another. And that the, okay. path, the path to peace, yeah. if you study history and you study human nature and you study culture and how this power politics has played out uh, for the last 22 civilizations that we can study and know about anyway, um, what you find is a very repeatable pattern hmm. where if a civilization does not uh, embrace change in order to adapt and stay relevant hmm. to the strategic environment around them, they will be overcome by a more powerful civilization. Yeah. In other words, the rise and fall of civilizations. Mm-hmm. Uh, it may sound like something you would read in a philosophy book, but it plays out every day. And so what we have to realize as an American society 
is that if we do not pursue this business of space, if we do not responsibly and sustainably develop the economy of space yeah. for uh, a better use of information, energy, and, all, and communications and transportation, then some other civilization will. Yeah. And if that civilization is somebody we can trust and that will have the same values that we respect every person, no matter where they came from, yeah. then we're just fine. Mm -hmm. But if the civilization that develops this power, this economic power of space, yeah. to be able to do all these things we do now, but cheaper and faster, mm -hmm. um, if they do not believe in the respect for every other human being, then we will be forced to submit to their values. This is, this is what we have to worry about, and it's a legitimate worry. Mm -hmm. um, because right now we are not moving as fast as China into space. And if China industrializes at first, we have the potential that we will be forced to abide by China's rules of international economics and not the rules that have been set up in the Westphalian system. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, uh, I'm going to go to the book here mm -hmm. uh, from your an excerpt from the foreword that you wrote in here where you're describing this exactly in, in more detail. You say a couple of things. China has since drained trillions of dollars worth of intellectual property from the West illegally, lured away our manufacturing sectors with unfair trade practices, embedded hundreds of thousands of their people as students in our universities, research centers, and engage in ongoing misinformation campaigns designed to pit Americans against one another, which we don't need more things to pit us against each other. There's, there's plenty of that. Um, I want to, I want to talk about this next section for a second here. He said, worse still, an aggressive China is now seizing territory from its neighbors using islands that they themselves created in old, in order to bolster their threadbare claims of ownership over various island chains, all the while disregarding an international court's rejection of such claims, adding to the disregard of international law. Uh, ple they pledged not to weaponize the islands, and then they did. Expand on the, the, the Spartly Islands, I think, is one example mm -hmm. of those. Expand on those a little bit, because I know probably a lot of the you know men and women listening that have the strategic mind, that are connected to the military, they know exactly what you're talking about. Plenty of others do not. Give a little overview of what's going on there. Well, the, uh, when you read the history of other civilizations, you see that China is doing exactly what um, has always taken place, hmm. and that is that they are putting their own interests ahead of the interests of other countries around them. They, uh, they are trying to feed their people, these are all noble things and things that we should not be worried about. But um, when they start um, stealing from others, when they start uh, um, lying, and, uh, and, and when they start doing things that, um, that are against our values, uh, we have to sit up and pay attention and ask ourselves the following question. Um, if they treat the Uyghurs and those Tibetans and the yeah. people in Hong Kong the way they're treating them now. Mm -hmm. Forced castration. Right. Oh, harvesting of organs from live people because they were criminals or because they were sick. Uh, you know, these are facts that are irrefutable and uh, obvious. So it, it reveals a value structure. Mm. And uh, the question is... Um, uh, do we as a nation um, believe in our values of uh, the respect and dignity of every human being enough to be able to uh, defend ourselves against the encroachment of a society that does not value people? Hmm. It, deval it values the Communist Party and the Central Party, yeah. and uh, it, 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 it's just a different worldview. And uh, because this goes back to the relationship of power. Gotcha. If, if you have power and you can exert that power over another nation, 
um, there is nothing that nation can do. And they're exerting power by uh, doing a number of things in America that are counter to our values. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just the disinformation campaign, but when you see another nation try to divide America, um, it, it starts tearing away at the structure of our, our sense of belonging as a people. Yeah. When you see them buying up the energy markets, the agricultural markets, for example, in agriculture, when you take a look at the agricultural industrial base of America, okay. the number one largest owner of that is China now. Okay. Of our agricultural of, land. Uh, land and uh, the capability to produce, which includes you know warehouses and uh, production. Uh, yeah, so this, I mean, that that is shocking to most people. Yeah, or is there not some sort of legislation that prohibits outside well government uh, entities purchasing outright, or so, these just random so this fake people? So this goes back to um, this delicate balance where China is using our free market and the fact that the business case is unique in every place and business people get to have free will to make business decisions. Okay. Um, this is China being very strategic about um, uh, gobbling up the land and the agricultural industrial, industrial base of America, uh, one decision at a time. I'll, I'll give you one in the energy market. So mm -hmm. in Texas, in, uh, right on the border, Del Rio area, uh, there are, um, there's vast land and a lot of wind farms out there. Hmm. And um, China uh, offered, a Chinese company offered to buy a tremendous portion of the energy market there in Texas. And there was nothing illegal about um, the purchase. Hmm. And Congress was notified and they looked at it. Um, and the question is, where do you draw the line where the government tells an owner of land or a company that you cannot sell it to China without creating this problem we talk about of fear mongering for, uh, and, and the question is, is there a reason to fear monger? Is there a reason to not do this? And you can make the uh, argument that there is a reason to block it. Yeah. Because energy is such a key element of national security. If a foreign nation owned enough of the infrastructure of energy or agriculture to be able to shut it down because of their business um, authority, yeah. uh, that would be a national security crisis in America. But you don't want government to be oppressive and being dictating, you know, mm -hmm. saying you as an owner of land cannot sell it to that person, but you right. can sell it to that person because we like them. Yeah, uh, this, like it's way it's, too choppy. <laughs> uh, it's a very gray area, and this is why it's not easy. But this is, yeah. this is uh, the, the central point here for your listening audience to... Um, uh, to consider is uh, the um, uh, the fact that we as a country um, have to defend our values mm -hmm. and our values are based on our beliefs and and we we uh, you know we have to pay attention to every policy and we have to pay attention to what's going on around us in business and uh, we need to hold our politicians accountable for this delicate balance of protection. But we have to be aware mm -hmm. that China is using our strength as a weapon against us. They are using our open society mm -hmm. and our free will and our free market as a way of insidiously trying to strangle us mm -hmm. uh, with control of these essential markets. My company, Genesis Systems, China has tried to buy this company 11 times through different proxies. And they're very, very subtle about it. They will hire a person that then hires a person. And so we're talking to an American that wants to give us, you know, $10 million. Wow. And as we do our forensics accounting on where that money is coming from, when we follow the money, it leads right back to China and the Chinese Communist Party. And so we don't sell. Uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't take that money. Sure. But it's hard. You know, you're a startup. Somebody's offering you $10 million and you have to say no. Uh, <sighs> but, but it's because we know yeah. that once they own a piece of the company, then they will start dictating policy 
Mm-hmm. It's like the universities. Many universities out there, I have many professors that want to write about what's going on with China and how they are insidiously entangling themselves into the energy, energy market, telecommunication market, and agricultural market in America. And some of them have, some of those professors have been fired because the board of directors, uh, their largest endowment is from China. And China sees that professor draft an article and they say, you will not publish that. Oh. The latest Top Gun movie, Maverick. Fantastic. Well, believe it or not, oh, no. China, because they own such a large portion of that company that made that movie, okay. they had to reshoot a whole bunch of scenes in that movie because China thought that it was anti-Chinese. And it was so- simple things like a patch with Taiwan on it. <laughs> okay? So this is how powerful... <sighs> Uh, insidious uh, influence that money brings yeah. when China brings the money. And it, it, it is riddled through most sectors in our society. I didn't even make the connection until literally just now about the universities. Yeah. Right. We're, we're sending a ton of people to be educated in the West. Such No, it sounds great. Such an, yeah. And all of a sudden now they're the largest endowment and now they're pulling the purse strings and I mean, you look at what's happened. People on like the right will complain and have been complaining for years and years. Oh, look at, you know, how crazy the higher education has gotten. It's barely even teaching any of the classic, you know, classic liberal uh, philosophies of the United States. Some of that makes a lot more sense now if it's being dictated by the guys that have 40% of the endowment. Yep. Yeah. So uh, whether it's the Confucius centers. Um, that are uh, funneling money in and students in. Uh, Did you say the confusion centers? No, I said Confucius. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Have you ever heard of that? I have not. Yeah, so um, take a look at uh, uh, the universities in America and just Google uh, Confucius centers. And what you'll find is um, mm. China has essentially planted these centers in universities across America. And they do it by giving an endowment to the university and say, we'd like to establish a Confucius center. But what it is, mm. is it's a place where Chinese students um, um, are uh, funded and uh, resourced. And you just take a look at the statistics of how many of them uh, take the research from that university back to China. Yeah. And when you take a look at China's pattern of theft of intellectual property uh-huh. through the universities and through industry, and then the duplication of that technology, and then the flooding of the markets, um, it has been a pattern that's been around for a while. For example, uh, people can study Lucent Technologies, Motorola, and uh, Nortel, three telecommunication companies that were the giants back in the late uh, 1990s. Mm -hmm. And China offered them access to the billion plus market, telecommunication market in China. And uh, they were all excited. I mean, those three companies were pretty excited here. We have access to this billion person market. um, And uh, all we have to do is share our intellectual property with the Chinese uh, uh, Communist Party. And uh, within six years, all three were bankrupt. (laughs) And uh, Huawei was built out of the carcasses of those three companies. Uh, And the pattern of... uh, Huawei stealing the IP, duplicating the technology with their own manufacturers and and the government fueling and subsidizing uh, the Huawei company Mm -hmm. and then flooding the world market. That's how Huawei was able to lead 5G with really no answer by the West uh, because of the unfair trade practices that were taking place. Again, these take a lot of research and time to unpack. Uh, Most Americans are oblivious to it, Uh, but uh, these are examples of a pattern of behavior Mm -hmm. where China is not playing fair economically, culturally, informationally. Uh, They are telling lies within our universities and Mm -hmm. within our media. They own the media. They own the universities. They own Hollywood. They Mm -hmm. own the agricultural industry. They own a large portion of the telecommunications industry. And they are owning a larger and larger portion of the energy energy industry. So think about food, energy, water, information. You know, the lifeblood of Americans understanding what's going on around them and doing something about it. 
And somebody controlling all that in a way where you don't know what to believe, you don't even know what the real story is. How can you fight for freedom when you don't even control the mechanisms of information and, uh, and you can be blackmailed yeah. by somebody turning off your energy, turning off your water, turning off your funding source for university hmm. because they don't like what you say. It, uh, it yeah. starts really eating away at our values. Are we a free people? And do we defend that freedom against foreign actors that are, have proven track records of trying to steal it away? Golly. Yeah, I mean, my, 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 the, you can probably see steam coming out of my ears here because I've been aware that China is involved, but not to this extent. Yeah. Well, it's public knowledge and public record. But again, this goes have, you, back the to... The algorithms have to make sure you find it. Right. Or not. Or not. Uh, and this is why um, big tech and uh, the, you know, the media giants um, do not go there because yeah. uh, they would have funding um, uh, restricted. The, uh, but this goes back to your point that I think is really important. Mm -hmm. Not dwell on the fear or the negative. Correct. Um, but, but address it. Be aware of it. Mm -hmm. But there is, n there is nothing more powerful than uh, entrepreneurs in a free market with vision. Hmm. And uh, so the Central Communist Party is always going to be yeah. um, second place if, if we are allowed to be free. And here's why. Uh, the Communist Party requires control. They control the narrative. They control the people. And when you control people, they are less innovative. Mm -hmm. They are uh, less motivated. And they are less happy. Because, again, I believe and we believe in America that a free spirit mm -hmm. is what makes you happy. And if you are a spirit that's being controlled or you're a bird in a cage, um, on average, you will be less happy than a person that's free. Now, yeah. freedom does not mean safety all the time. So no. if, if you, again, this gets back to safety. If you, yeah, yeah. if you say safety is the only thing I care about, then you just need to be in a prison cell where you get three square meals a day and yep. uh, you don't have to worry about anything. You'll that's be safe. perfectly safe. Uh, freedom comes with balancing risk. Yeah. When you're running through the woods, you know, yeah. you could trip and fall. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, but uh, why I'm so hopeful, why there is such uh, a place for um, happy uh, persistence and optimism is that if the American people still believe in their hearts that a free society is worth fighting for, mm. then all they have to do is unleash their entrepreneurs with a lack of regulations that allow them to try new things, hmm. and we will out-innovate um, any other culture on the planet. Hmm. I, I'm convinced of that, having watched other cultures and studied other cultures very carefully. Yeah. There are just as many creative people in China as there are in America, hmm. and there are more geniuses in China than, uh, you know, than... Uh, you know, the we then uh, then we have honor students yeah. across all the <laughs> yeah, grades. For sure. So you you have to respect the fact that they're going to do some pretty innovative things. Oh yeah. And we have we have to be careful not to over um, um, over rely on this free spirit. Yeah. But they will always be hobbled by the fact that there is a central system making the decision on winners and losers. And what we know is you can't predict anything. No. You just let people explore and try, and the best of breed will win. Hmm. I, th you're right. That is, a, that is a better way to, to frame it down there at the bottom of wrapping that optimistic bow on it. I, I'm thinking about you know all those different industries. Um, within the space sector, there is one advantage there, which is that ITAR which I don't even remember exactly what it stands for, International Trade. Yeah, it's basically, for your listeners, it's a yeah, mechanism please. to make sure that the things we are inventing in America are not released to other countries. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's very active in the space industry, and it's extremely difficult to work on a space program, space technology, if you are not here in the U.S., got your citizenship, or, or probably there's a few examples for, for green cards, etc. Probably not many, though, I'm assuming. 
Well, yeah, but uh, th- that is not a panacea of security. And right. uh, so, yeah. uh, do, you know, that, that, for example, okay. why does the Chinese jet look just like our F-22 and F-35? <laughs> why does their um, X space um, reusable launch vehicle look exactly like SpaceX's? reusable launch vehicle. Yeah. The industrial espionage of uh, all these vulnerable SCADA systems that we have that um, are designed to be open and free. That's how the internet was designed. And the ability to get even inside air gaps within systems hmm. um, and China's uh, very robust investment in industrial espionage. Uh, you can have all those regulations you want on ITARs, but it is not stopping China from stealing our intellectual property. Yeah. The only way, and we do this in our company, we have designed our intellectual property and our protections based on kind of a military model. Uh, and it's also kind of what Elon Musk does as well. And that is, uh, there's uh, one layer of protection is the... Uh, um, you know, like the intellectual property uh, by uh, applying for patents and things like that. Sure. And, but that doesn't save you. The only thing that ultimately saves you is innovating faster than your competition <laughs> so that the marketplace is always choosing you because you are the best of breed. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and so speed is life, as we say in the Air Force, but speed is security as well. If you are uh, trying to build Fort Knox around um, hmm. a, a drawing that is uh, going to be your bread and butter as a, a differentiator in a business, um, you are going to build, uh, spend all your money building your uh, Fort Knox around it as China has already stole it out from under you and is manufacturing it somewhere in their country. Yeah. So um, okay. don't... Uh, Just go faster. I, yeah, ITARs, you know, they... It, it slows it down a little bit, but not a lot. Yeah. So maybe, okay, so then, you know, one of the other groups that I'm talking uh, out there with is Foundation for the Future. Mm-hmm. Um, and they are crafting legislation to say, hey, why do we not have a Fannie Mae, Freddie, Ma- Freddie Mac type infrastructure debt investment opportunity for the space industry? Well, uh, they can say that, but uh, this goes back to human nature and governance. Okay. Uh, the reason Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae failed us and the reason we had the crash is because mm-hmm. government officials were putting their thumb on the scale uh, based on ideology, not on the free market. Okay. 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 And so if you do the same with space, what yeah. you're going to do is you're going to be giving a government bureaucrat the authority to pick winners and losers based on their idea of what might be a good idea and what might not. And this goes back to any society that tries to control innovation Hmm. will always attenuate the speed of innovation. And it it ruins the magic sauce of a free market. (laughs) Yeah, and yeah. and we see the results of that. I mean, the book, uh, uh, you know, Good to Great, for example, was okay. written before uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac crashed and burned our housing market because of their government um, um, subsidized and government um, influence mm-hmm. on decisions with regard to loans and, and housing, uh, all under the guise of uh, we need to... Uh, make this available to everybody, yeah. regardless, regardless of their socioeconomic status. Okay. Um, and so, um, you, uh, you, so Good to Great was just applauding that these two companies yeah. were great because of the leaders. And they may have been good <laughs> leaders, but their success was not based on their leadership. The success was based on the a bias of government Push. uh, pushing the scale in their favor until it blew up in our face and the whole country and really the whole world had to pay the price. All the people that lost um, wealth and their retirements in 2008 can thank the federal government for that little trick. And here somebody's trying it again with the space industry and I hope they do not succeed because again, it's putting, it's, it's putting Mm. safety in front of progress. Okay. Okay. I see. Yeah. I mean, it comes back to in, in a, right. Th- this country, we came here and it, it is the land of the beautiful because we spent sweat and blood and toil to 
hoe, backhoe, and get rid of all the rocks and plant stuff down. It takes the actual work. And because there's been so much sweat, toil, and blood, we now have the de- debate between do you want safety or do you want opportunity? And for however many, the first, let's call it 180, 200 years or whatever of this country was, I want opportunity. And we've slowly shifted more towards, ah, safety sounds pretty nice. Well, this is why no civilization ever lasts forever, because um, it goes back to human nature. Human nature is lazy. Uh, Now, it doesn't mean everybody's lazy. The entrepreneurs and the workaholics uh, carry (laughs) the, uh, the economy. But left to its own accord, people are lazy. Yeah. And if they, um, uh, and again, it's not, uh, there's a survival mechanism to that where don't do something stupid, dangerous, or different. You know, just do what works in the past and you'll be safe. Sure. Uh, and that works okay. But uh, eventually it will be the end of your society. Hmm. You, you have to be uh, willing to take prudent risk and allow the chaos of the free market to kind of stew on all these ideas to let the best of breed win naturally. And any, and that's why we have to fight our federal government over controlling our market. Hmm. Um, but people who basically say, no, it's not fair. Fairness is like safety in that sense. <laughs> it's not fair. Uh, the person that does not work hard should make as much money as the person that works hard. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not fair. And, but they miss, the, they miss the fact that life is not fair. And if they try to make life fair, all they will do is dumb everybody down. And we've seen that communism yeah. is if we were all angels, <laughs> it would be a brilliant mindset. Yep. Okay. If everybody was good mm-hmm. and there were no evil people, but what happens if you build communism or this redistribution where the person that works hard has to give up all their hard work the per- to the person that's lazy and doesn't want to do anything. So they have mm-hmm. equal means. Right. Um, and when you do that, if we were all angels, everybody would be happy. But what happens is some evil per- person takes advantage of that and then they can control the mechanisms of production. They, uh, and that's what communism has done yeah. every time it's tried, whether it's Stalin, Lenin, Marx, uh, Hitler in the form of fascism, mm-hmm. the, um, those isms uh, have turned out to be the, mis- the, the, the greatest source of historical murder hmm. the human race has ever seen. Yeah. And yeah. yet every generation um, plays with that dynamite. Yeah. You know, every young person that's raised, you know, comes in and says, why can't we all just get along? Why can't the rich just give us all their money so everybody's happy? Yeah. And they, they miss out on the reality of human nature where if you do not work hard for something, you don't value it. Yeah. And that you have to incentivize hard work. Mm-hmm. And so um, you take something that is in isolation, not good. We call it greed. Okay, yeah. greed is not good, and at least in my belief as yeah. a Christian, uh, greed is not good. But what we have done is we have uh, our founding fathers, and the, from the Magna Carta on, have basically said, okay, we are going to take this imperfect thing called a human being, mm-hmm. and we're going to create a government that it releases all the powerful energy of people working for their own happiness. Hmm. And the harder they work, the more they can keep of what they've done. They still have to give something up for the common defense and for those things that are too expensive for any one person to do. Like when we built the Panama Canal or the roads in America or the airport systems in America Mm -hmm. for transportation. Um, But we incentivize free will and hard work. And uh, communism or any of these other philosophies that basically say, well, why can't we all just get along and why can't we have a... Uh, universal income so everybody gets something and nobody has to work hard to live. Yeah. Um, that sounds great, but it turns into um, the road to serfdom, as Hayek has so famously yeah, it, written about. It, yeah, it destroys incentive, absolutely. So so what's the solution for, for the U.S. Of, in space, right? If, we're, if, if China is quickly gaining speed on us they produce more engineers every year yeah than we have in our entire country right hat off to them right that's what happens when you have a massive population that's right now it's not sustainable if there's like i think the ratio of men to women it's like eight men to one woman uh so a lot of those guys are 
they're not going to be able to reproduce. But for this next generation, they're brilliant and they're making some great stuff. Yeah. And as we discussed, they're really adequate at, at stealing intellectual property. They've got some insane space ambitions and the u.s has entrepreneurship that's a massive skill but i mean that's that's our that's our main advantage so i guess like how do we incentivize how do we help those entrepreneurs without government pushing thumb right that in a sense is just going to make it all tumble yeah so um go back and read the fast space study that we published a few years ago um, because it really uh, strikes that very um, point of what's the first domino. And it goes to what you say. Uh, you know, this is what we do in the military. The art of war is about playing to your strengths to yeah. create competitive advantage that your enemy cannot compete with yeah. or your competition can't compete with. Because I'll, I'll just call China competition. Sure. Only because I would rather have American values in the space rule of law than Chinese values where they... Um, kill, lie, steal, cheat, and, uh, and yeah. basically um, do not respect human life. Yeah. Uh, so um, what you do is you, um, you know, the fast space study essentially was uh, designed to help Congress and the American people understand what we could do to unleash this one unique competitive advantage we have in America, and that's our creative uh, industrial base. That's a better way to and say it. And all these in entrepreneurs that yeah. know how to make a business case close to design something useful and novel for the human race and for the American market and for the international market. Mm -hmm. And how you do that is um, the same model that uh, has been used before, but y it's, it's Congress um, allowing the government to explore public-private partnerships in a way that um, that that has proven to be successful in the past. The problem is Congress is afraid to, um, and, and uh, not Congress, but government is afraid. Huh. So Congress has written the laws that allow us all kinds of other transactional authorities. It's as if the government, huh. like let's say NASA or uh, the Department of Defense, and I'll use the Department of Defense because I know this one personally, sure. as an astronautical engineer and then as a commanding general in the Air Force, I got to watch this play out. Yeah. And is the fear of bureaucrats in the government, mm -hmm. in DOD, that are afraid to use these authorities Congress has given them to allow the private sector to thrive. Hmm. Um, and uh, they, they, um, they try to over-control the public-private partnerships. They try to choose winners and losers. And they are afraid of Congress, uh, that Congress will think they're overreaching. And they're afraid of failure. What if this doesn't work? So uh, hmm. to put it in a nutshell, um, the way America can win this race uh, in a way that is guaranteed is if um, the government is willing to partner with private companies to incentivize competition, okay, okay. In, uh, and never down-select uh, never down select. Even uh, you know you down select to uh, the two or three companies that show promise, mm -hmm. and you you even in the operational phase uh, you don't down select. You have competition. <clears throat> Every company is building something, and there's somebody else out there incentivized to compete with them. Mm -hmm. And so the creative juices and the competitive juices. If you incentivize Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos against one another, good things happen for the country and the world, okay? Yeah. Because they both are winners and they both like to win and they both know how to win. Yep. Um, and this is the magic art of public-private partnerships um, that the government has been afraid to uh, unleash. Hmm. Um, and um, it, it's sad. Uh, the entrepreneurs see it and uh, Congress sees it, yeah. but the government is the big juggernaut here the the aspect that they are afraid to release are saying that's like so sorry spacex and blue origin those are the big fish the those guys can i mean i think spacex has raised like 18 separate financing rounds or something insane like that a lot of the smaller scale space companies right we have sb Oh, I, always, I always say this backwards. SBRs. SBRs. Sibbers. Yeah. yeah, Sibbers, right? So that's government money. Hey, we'll incentivize a little bit. Go do your innovation, such and such. 
and it lasts for a set amount of time and then you have to go out into the public markets. That sounds like one of the tools that they could be using. Well, it's uh, they've tried and it's not working. Yeah. But it's uh, it goes back to government control. Um, okay. And the, the fact that bureaucrats are not entrepreneurs. Uh, right. Government um, bureaucrats uh, are not risk takers. No. And uh, they... Um, they uh, the incentive structure within the government is if you uh, spend money on something that doesn't produce, you, you get fired or, you know, you, you can't take risk. Failure is not an option. And when that's the case, they uh, take the uh, safe path because their career, their next job, their promotion is based on that. It is like uh, it's inconsistent with uh, the entrepreneurial nature of our um, space industrial base. And uh, that's the big problem. So the fast space study was to help Congress yeah. understand and to write into legislation uh, these actions that force government hmm. uh, to incentivize competition in the all the phases of the development of capability. But uh, okay. so, but it needs to be coupled with another piece that's missing, and that is a vision. Okay. The okay. vision. So th this is, um, you know, societies fall apart because of a lack of vision. And right now, America does not have a vision for space. No. And it, it, right now, it hasn't become fatal because uh, these business leaders in America are are designing things that are setting the table for the industrialization of space. All the things required. Now, Bezos and Elon Musk are the big ones that everybody knows about, and sure. they're they're primarily in the transportation realm. Right. But in the propulsion uh, realm, in the communication realm, in the energy delivery realm, yeah. um, and in the computing realm, there there are companies that are just doing amazing things. They're smaller companies. They're mm -hmm. not well known, uh, but uh, they are the up and comers of the future. Uh, from Stoke to Nebula to Link that I mentioned before, mm -hmm. um, they are the ones, uh, you know, and again, the marketplace will determine the winners and losers. Right. Uh, we, we don't put our thumb on that scale. <laughs> but if we had a president that would articulate a vision for space yeah. uh, and Congress was willing to legislate the requirement for the government to partner with private industry and public-private partnerships that truly do incentivize mm -hmm. the competitive environment, it would release such power mm -hmm. in uh, the marketplace of America that we would launch past all, no pun intended, we would <laughs> launch past all competitors across the globe to, to include China. So, so digging into that for a second, you said like right, they would be incentivizing it. First, we need the vision, which we can talk about mm -hmm. that in a second. Um, but the incentive structure, I guess I'm just trying to understand, right? So let me back that up. Actually, I think one of the problems with the Sibbers is that it's, yeah, it's government money going towards private industries, but it's bureaucrats write the requirements. Yes. We yeah. need these. We think we want these 50 parts developed in the next couple of years. Go figure it out. Outcomes, yeah. What are what are the what are the capabilities? What are the capabilities? Yeah, and, okay. that's, and the government tends to go down the path of micromanaging, uh, like the Sibbers. And I, yeah, yeah. So, for example, um, when I uh, I I, uh, I was part of the Sibbers in uniform and uh, mm -hmm. tried to uh, recover it, but it was unrecoverable uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, but when I got out and I was the president of this company, we were on the other end applying mm. for Sibbers. So Sibbers may sound like a good idea conceptually, but the sure. way it's written, it most companies will die and run out of money well before they get the kind of capability or the kind of investment from the Sibbers uh, to actually deliver the capability that's being asked for. Yeah. Uh, they will um, meet a milestone and the government will trickle out a little bit of money. Yeah. And then, then they'll say, well, we want six other studies because we're worried about that, worried about that. And the company goes out of business long before uh, those studies are done because they can take years. Okay. And all it takes is one bureaucrat worried about um, one little tiny thing yeah. uh, because they're afraid. They're afraid of failure. They're afraid of risk. Hmm. And it kills the entire program. So I have not seen a Sibbers okay. that's done anything meaningful or become a program of record uh, that was of anything uh, worthy 
the money is too small, yeah. and uh, the the, um, the the hierarchy within the government um, is uh, not protecting um, that freedom. Yeah. The bureaucrats want control. That's the nature of bureaucracies. It's just not working. So um, it's not hard to incentivize this, but you need uh, Congress is going to have to be more heavy handed at forcing the governmental agencies through law uh, to incentivize the outcomes and not micromanage the winners and losers and the technique. OK. OK. Incentivize the outcomes versus. Yeah. So. So that could be a whole nother three hour podcast if you, but <laughs> yeah. first read the fast space study because yeah. it will give you practical steps. Okay. And what's again, insidious about it is uh, Congress has enacted a number of those steps in the years since that was written and they've been studying it and they've been uh, following the, the, the playbook. Nice. But now it's kind of uh, bumped up against a lack of vision. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, the, 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 you need a, 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 with this big of a step, Mm -hmm. You need a president yeah. that is willing to articulate a clear and unambiguous vision of what America is going to do uh, to uplift the human condition with space. And with that vision, coupled with the laws that allow government to take these risks and with leaders in the government that know how to take risk, you can solve this problem overnight. The laws are in place, huh. but the leadership is not in the government and yeah. the vision is not there. So an example maybe of that vision would be a president coming in and one describing the competition that we're currently in with China and then two, maybe articulating in some way, right, you know, one of SpaceX's, I don't know if it's still their mottos, but one of their old one was waste steel, not time. I was like, innovate, try new things, try new things, try new things. If it fails, it fails. Next. Yeah. And say, hey, we're going to send a, a lot of money Yes, taxpayer dollars towards these things. And yes, some of them will fail. Maybe even a majority of them. But this is the reason why that's necessary. This is the reason why that's important. This is what our country was founded and built for. And these are the stakes that we are currently fighting against. Would you say like something, you know, a, a presidential articulation of that? Yeah. Even, even that is uh, too in the weeds uh, for the presidential level. But that, okay. that conversation has to happen at multiple levels in, uh, yeah. in, in society. <clears throat> it has to happen at the governmental level and all the way down to the neighborhood level. level. Hmm. Um, but uh, for a president, uh, it has to be a little uh, higher level. Sure. Um, and uh, f for example, and this comes down to a vision without the right leaders will never be executed because the president can't do everything. So, right. uh, for example, you'd need a secretary of the Space Force, which right now we don't have. We have a secretary of the Air Force that's also in charge of the Space Force. Yeah. The problem with that is every free dollar goes to air power. And so the, the budget, when you follow the money, the budget of the Space Force is a joke yeah. compared to the budget of the Air Force. Yet the Space Force is the main event of the strategic environment globally that's unfolding rapidly in front of us. And whoever controls space will be able to see and kill anything the Air Force could build. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's like having an airplane um, flying over troops, dropping bombs on them, and the troops don't have guns that can even reach the aircraft. Yeah. Space is going to be that dominant with everything terrestrial, Navy, Army, Air Force. Um, and yet uh, the Space Force is being strangled financially yeah. because of the huge appetite of the Army and the Navy and the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are the baby in the crib that's being strangled by the yeah. big brothers that are either jealous or don't see the consequences of not growing this young baby into the strongest uh, uh, hero of the universe <laughs> that yeah. uh, it can be. It's but, like they're, they're, they've got, you know, probably even less budget than the Marine Corps. Right. And that's made up with, of a bunch of Marines that say, yeah, give me two bucks and we'll, we'll yeah. find a way. And this is not to say those other services aren't important. Of it's just not. to say that there has to be a, a balance of priorities, you know, what's important. Yeah. And, uh, you can't just go back to the same old button of one third, of the budget goes to the army, one third goes to the Navy, one third goes to the air force. And then out of that one third for the air force, they can dole out whatever they want to the space force. Yeah. That is the bureaucratic answer that's been played out over the years that has to change. And you're not going to change it without a president being willing to put in the political capital, uh, to get Congress to come along. 
Um, okay. And so uh, let me give you a, um, an example statement of a presidential vision. But this has to be coupled with that president picking the right leaders mm. that know how to manage a big bureaucracy and incentivize risk-taking, prudent risk-taking, and force the organization to actually partner with private companies in a way that unleash the creative juices of the entrepreneurial class of American marketplace in space. Okay. Okay. So it, it's the vision and then the leaders. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And if the president states a good vision, but doesn't pick the right leaders, the old leaders will um, either passively or because they're not capable, they will not be able to wrestle the, the gorilla of the bureaucracy to do what the president said. Tracking. And that happens a lot. Yeah. Uh, so you got to you got to have the right leaders. So a president's vision, for example, would be America is going to sustainably and responsibly industrialize space to protect the planet from anything in space that might put at risk any country on the planet, because with that you can protect America. But with one in uh, capital investment, you can yeah, protect yeah. any country that's a friend of America or any country that has people because we care about people. Right. Because um, it's a network, not a linear system. That's right. And that um, America uh, will industrialize space uh, for the benefit of all mankind and deliver the essentials of life, communication, hmm. energy, information, and transportation for the global economy. We will create the global uh uh, the global commons mm. of, um, of commerce in space. And it will benefit all people with rule of law that discriminates against no one. You know, something like that is yeah. the, uh, the visionary statement. And then you let the entrepreneurs go to, go to work on that. Yeah. And the reason you need a presidential level vision and then the government, um, unleashing uh, the, um, the resources to these entrepreneurs is because the price point of entry to space is so large that only the Bezos and the Musks of the world have been able to do it. It would be like mm -hmm. asking a small company to build the Panama Canal. Teddy Roosevelt didn't do that. What he did is mm. he um, allowed, uh, he recognized that if the Panama Canal were built, uh, the time to deliver goods would be cut in half and the price of the goods would be cut in half because of the transportation. Yeah. And, um, and, and th so this is why the government needs to be involved in this. The government can't just say, well, we'll let the uh, entrepreneur class figure this out. <laughs> if they do, China will beat us to the punch because the Chinese government recognizes yep. the power of where the government applies. But the Chinese failure is they are dictating that money to winners and losers that they're choosing. Yeah. They're not letting the free market choose. America can do the same thing. Let the free market choose. It will move faster and it will be a better solution that's cheaper for mm. the customer. And that will change the world. Hmm. Well, I'm going to clip that out and save that as a file for sure. No, that's that's really well said. Uh, and, and, you know, to that last part, like if when you have the resources that China has and you don't care about sacrificing a few million people for the goal of the collective, you can still get to your end goal. Absolutely. Uh, and you'll get there faster than some. Because, right, if, if you have a company that should lose in a free market system and you keep throwing infinite amounts of money at it, it'll produce a product. Yep. It won't be the best. Inferior, yes. But it, it will produce a product. Um, and so, that yeah, that is a hopeful vision to show the difference of those two dichotomies, the, the strength that we have to offer. But, you know, there's a, a, an important side note to that because that's optimistic. Uh, and the side note is that the disproportionate power of space, even if it's an yeah, inferior yeah. product, can be so catastrophic that the fight is over before you even have a chance. And it mm -hmm. would be, uh, here's an example for your listeners. And that is um, at the beginning of World War II, when we knew that Germany was pursuing the atomic bomb, it would be tantamount to us saying, well, we'll see if any of our companies uh, in America can, can do that. 
uh, knowing that the boundary condition of that is if Germany wins that race, they will literally blow America off the face of the earth and we would all be speaking German right now. Uh, no, I'm of German heritage, so sure, I sure. can say that without uh, <laughs> offending anybody. Uh, but, but it would be uh, say companies but, figure it out. Right. Uh, we, you know, yeah. the government's not going to help you. You guys figure it out and we'll get there in time. That's what's happening <laughs> right now. Our space companies are, are working and they'll get there in time. But even an inferior um, capability by China can be so uh, catastrophic with regard to the power differential. When with a space constellation, they can see and destroy anything that flies above the trees. Yeah, yeah. Or paralyze an entire base of fighter aircraft or any ship on the ocean, just all electrons stop working. Uh, you know, and, and they can do it with pennies. You know, just one command to a constellation of three satellites with a little directed energy down to this fleet yeah. sailing across the Pacific. And the fleet is a cork in the water, you know, corks in the water Jeez. or a hundred F 35s on a ramp in Guam. Yeah. All impotent with about 10 cents worth of energy, uh, for a command to satellites being powered by solar or nuclear that can uh, create an EMP that destroys all that investment. And those, you know, billions of dollars of aircraft on the ramp are all just hunks of junk. Huh. And so the, the, the counterbalance to that, right, if you can have satellites that do directed EMP, the counterbalance is not let's protect the F-35s from EMP such and such. No. It's too expensive, too slow. Too slow. It's, it's being on a level playing field of deterrence and reassurance in the same domain uh, of space. There it is. And this is why okay. the government has a responsibility in the national security domain uh, to articulate to the American people that we must go to space yeah. so that we can maintain the rule of law and that if anybody tries to use the power of space against America or any of our friends, we can stop them. And mm -hmm. if China is there first without our presence on equal playing field, yeah. we will not be able to stop them. Yeah. So that is both fear and optimism. Yeah. Optimism in that the... The most historic way to a peaceful future is by building strength yeah. and then having values of respect for human beings. And the most certain way to um, conflict and war hmm. and, and regret is to um, not prepare with strength, meaning to basically take a back seat. It's the nuclear analogy where, okay, Germany is building the nuclear bomb. Um, uh, we are going to create peace through strength, meaning we will be there with you and it's a deterrent so mm -hmm. that you will not use it because you know we have one. Um, if we took the passive route on that yeah. and Germany were evil enough to use that weapon and we had no way of defending ourselves, hmm. uh, we would get what we deserve. And that is the future I do not want to see in America. Now, if we're lucky and China is benevolent and they love Americans and they love our market and they would not do anything to hurt us or anybody else, then we might get lucky. Yeah. But my job as a national security professional is not to, not to prepare for the most hopeful outcome. Right. It's to prepare for the unexpected. Yeah. And you prepare for the unexpected by having the levers of power to do something about anything that somebody mm. else might do. That's where we're at as a nation right now. We have a very clear choice. Does the president hmm. actually care enough about our future to do what is historically required? And that is build strength in space strength. to bring rule of law yeah. and, and the path to peace. Hmm. Or do we not compete with China and space and just pray that they will have pity on us and not use their power against us? That's the yeah. clear historical choice here. Yeah. And right now we have no vision and we know have no main effort. And all we have is a leftover space force that was be the beginning of a vision. Yeah. And it's now being strangled in the crib because it's underfunded yeah. and it's not, it's not been given the, the, the green light yeah. 
mm-hmm. by the administration to actually build capability to save America. Yeah. Well, and like the, the strength analogy, right? You know, clearly you've got the history and the pedigree of, you know, studying the past 22 nations and that being your main role. So you understand that power balance of great countries. The same thing applies just to individual. Like think back to recess, right? Like the kid that got bullied was the kid with the slumped shoulders that when the bully came over and kicked him, it was the little kid that made gratifying noises when he got kicked. He's the one that kept getting bullied. But the ones that stood up straight and hopefully had some other friends around them and said, no, knock it off, even if he then got pummeled, but then said, knock it off again with some oomph behind his voice, he didn't get bullied that much. There's a, a guy I love out on the internet, Jordan Peterson. Yeah, I know. There was, there was a line. I, I didn't realize this. Um, right, so one of the, I believe it was from the Sermon of the Mount. Um, I think I'm going to quote it right. Jesus um, spoke, said, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And he, he dug into the word meek. He's like, what does that even mean? Like, we don't, we don't use that word anymore. Um, and from his study of the Hebrew and back and forth, he said, the best English analogy would be the meek are those who have swords and know how to wield them, but keep them sheathed. It's and it's not my definite like, but yeah. what a better picture of like no that's we we need strength and it's it's not just at a, a national level it's at an individual level. I was listening to some Jocko podcast on the way over here, awesome Navy Seal, and it comes down to the you know, how do we not get divided when sh- when China is infiltrating in our Facebooks and making bots that make people all the time. How do we? Build resilience personally, right? Do the actual workouts that are necessary. Get the personal strength that can secure your own freedom and therefore make you uh, less susceptible to the contagion of fear because you have that own personal strength. And when you when you build that in yourself, then you look around, you're like, oh, it'd be kind of nice if my whole country was doing these sort of things. Right. Well, that's true. I mean, I would say uh, the humility. I mean, there's a great quote by um, Socrates uh, on uh, never give a man a sword that can't dance. Uh, it, uh, you know, this love <laughs> of humanity and the fact yeah. that a person in uniform, if they have to use violence, they failed. Huh. Uh, you know, you, you, uh, you should have a strategy and strength so that you deter conflict and that's why the road to peace is through strength. Yeah. And uh, this is the choice America has right now. It's a great quote. It's about being humble. And humility is not being passive. Humility yeah. is not being um, um, uh, somebody who does not compete. Humility is the fact that you know yourself well enough and you mm-hmm. do not let pride or arrogance get in the way. And you design a strategy of such overwhelming strength that you can parlay that strength into nobody of evil mind doing anything to touch you or anybody Mm. else that is your friend because they know you could crush them if you chose to, but you never would because you love people. Hmm. Well phrased. So as we, as we look towards right expansion out into cislunar space, right? You gave the example of Chinese satellites, EMP taking out equipment like there. Let's say we have a presidential vision that comes into place. Uh, either the current administration makes a dramatic shift or in a few years there's an election and we get a vision statement. Then I just want a vision statement, right? That's that's what I'm in, I really care about. I'm not going to get down into the blue or the red. Flash forward to, okay, we're, we're trying to develop on the moon deep into cislunar space because... Yeah, we, we talked about earlier, space has practically infinite resources. However, from what I've realized, like the best places to start on the moon, right? The moon's great because gravitational body and resources and all these different things. From what I've realized, like the some of the best places to build a base are at the South Pole next to a crater where there's a lot of water and you're on a ridge line where there's sunlight. 
there's not a ton of those locations in the south south pole of the moon so i i guess i'm just curious because we we know china's rapidly approaching building moon bases up there beyond beyond what we've already discussed on the individual and the government like what can a vision for expanding out into Cisloon onto the moon, how can that directly benefit the rest of us in your perspective? Oh, my word. Well, you know, th- this is about um, being at the strategic high ground, which is a term uh, in the art of war. But um, when you're on top of the hill, you can see everybody coming up the hill and it's easier to work with gravity on your side than working against gravity. Mm-hmm. The same is true in space. There are certain strategic high grounds and the, you know, the South Pole of the Moon is one of them, the Lagrange points where the gravity is equal distance between the Moon and the Earth, so you can just hover there and then just with a little bit of energy, you, mm-hmm. can, get, you can get anything to transport anywhere in the cislunar space. But all of those are tactical things. Um, what I will tell you is the, the, uh, the more powerful question is mm-hmm. why, okay? okay. Um, and, uh, you know, when you talk about the infinite resources of the, um, of the universe, that's really what we're talking about. The question is, what's the best way to get there? And the best way to get there is going to change as technologies change. So, for example, okay. um, if you built a space station at the uh, Lagrange point that is the, you know, kind of the, the zero gravity part of between the Earth and the moon, mm-hmm. um, you uh, and 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 we develop uh, nuclear p- propulsion in space the way it's trending right now. Yeah, uh, you may not even need the water on the south side of the moon. You know, uh, and, and uh, on those uh, uh, on those ridge lines, uh, the way you need them now because mm. of the current limitation of propulsion and uh, and what water could do for that. Okay. Uh, so um, what you're describing are strategies that are predicated on assumptions that may or may not hold true as we go forward. And this okay. goes back to this idea of letting the free market decide <laughs> because um, by the time um, we get to a place where our grand vision yeah. um, allows us to um, do something, uh, what we do exactly in order to achieve those outcomes uh, may be different because it comes down to price points and novelty, usefulness, and values. So, for example, maybe we don't want uh, visible signs of industrialization on the moon from Earth because we like the look of the moon. Um, And if you can get the cost of transportation down with nuclear propulsion, for example, in cislunar space, uh, you could do all those in, uh, out of asteroids that are actually closer to us than the moon. Yeah, yeah. So now the transportation time is cut down, and you may not need water if you're using nuclear. Yeah, dig into that just because of byproducts or... Well, so this gets into the technical, and, and this okay. is why technology is such an important part of the art of war. Because right. technology changes power equations, and they change the fundamentals of competitive advantage. Yeah. So there's three fundamentals of competitive advantage that are going on here, right in front of our eyes in space. Hmm. The first is transportation. And again, this is not an order of importance necessarily. They all work inter, uh, intertwined together. Gotcha. But, uh, but the reason people are pretty aware of this is because of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. They're really attacking the transportation piece. And re- reusability to get out of the gravity well is the way they're manifesting it right now. For sure. But the bottom line is that when you, um, when you have a transportation modality in space that allows you to go to the right place at the right time, for the right reason, with the right stuff, yeah. um, and you can do it cheaper and faster than your competition, you have a competitive advantage, okay? The second is communication. Uh, and this means seeing and hearing and understanding what's going on around you. A ubiquitous capability of understanding and seeing anything going on on the backside of the moon, mm. around celestial bodies, but the ability to see and understand what's going on around you and communicate that to everybody on your team. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the second foundation of, um, of, of, of any kind of competitive advantage, both economically or militarily or politically. Yeah. And then the third is the energ- energizing that environment okay. so that every device that is in cislunar space is energized in one way or the other, whether it's solar, geothermal, you know, water propulsion. You know, there's all kinds of ways of energizing something. Hmm. Um, and that's energy. So I'll call it transportation, communication, and energy. Okay. 
Those are the three foundations. And the reason it plays into your comment on, well, what about the moon and what about the South Pole and what about this? Yeah. Those are all really interesting ideas, but they're very tactical yeah. and they're okay. all predicated on assumptions that may or may not hold true by the time we get there. But if you allow the industrial base, the space industrial base, to invest in these setting the table foundations yeah. of uh, faster, cheaper transportation, more ubiquitous communication, and uh, more uh, affordable energy in every aspect of cislunar economy, yeah. now you start opening up all kinds of options and you don't start running down a rabbit hole that might be too expensive, too slow, and do things that damage your value set. Okay, yeah. So I just warn people, uh, it's fascinating Fair. to talk about these things, yeah, no. but it's really wasted uh, effort uh, because the strategy is not baked enough yet. Okay. We don't even have a vision. Right. What are we trying to do? <laughs> so, so to that point and here, move the, move the mic down a little bit. Okay. So they yeah. can still see the lips. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm, I think it's probably good. So to that last point, right. Yeah. I've, I've, I've studied, you know, my dad in the air force, I've studied a decent amount of you know, warfighter history books, et cetera, whatever you want to call it. And it was, well, what I'm bringing up is right vision, strategy, tactic. Tactic is, you know, there's a terrorist training camp here. We will climb this hill. We will have these ODs come in and we'll come on the cover night. We'll knock them out. It'll be good. It'll be great. That's tactics. Strategy is we want to destroy terrorist training camps in this entire region. And vision is we want to safe and secure America and Western allies. Does that be like a fair sort of step sure. out? Mm -hmm. So in the same vein, to have government or military focus on tactics, focus on tactics, tactics first, that's the moot point. If it's, a, if it's step number three, sure, fine and dandy. If the Space Force is well-funded, they've got the vision, they've got the strategy, and then they want to tactically determine where's the best place to put their base, solid. But as we are discussing, and I'm trying to educate masses out here, core vision, core strategy, those really should be the focus. Fair? That is fair. And uh, it doesn't, you know, and, but you also want to make sure that work continues. Even in the absence of a vision yeah. and a strategy, that work continues. And this work is not wasted when the work applies to these planks of effectiveness, okay. transportation, communication, energy. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that's what your companies are doing. Uh, when yeah. you take a look at a company, you can generally put it into one of those three categories right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are creating the innovations that will fuel the platform for a great vision and then a great strategy mm -hmm. that, will be, uh, th that will help define what we call the strategy, strategy to task. Okay. Meaning that um, every task is uh, connected to the strategy that's connected to the vision and every dollar is connected in a way that's meaningful so that no money is spent on something that is not congruently moving us all towards the vision. Track. So, uh, so that's the good news is that, uh, you know, we don't have to, um, feel heartbroken that, uh, there is no vision mm -hmm. and there's no strategy and that there's all this chaos kind of churning around. Right. Um, there is regret, though, that the longer we go without a vision and without a strategy that's properly funded, mm -hmm. uh, the, f the, the more ground our competition makes yeah. and the more possible they could achieve capabilities uh, that make it almost impossible for us to catch up. So there is a danger that grows over mm -hmm. time when uh, and and. Uh, and the number of stories about civilizations and tragedies that have happened because of a lack of vision is legendary. I'll, I'll give yeah. you one example, just sure. one quick example. And um, this was after the uh, English uh, lost an entire generation of men in World War I. Huh. Okay? When they came back from that trench warfare, uh, they turned to their most respected uh, academician, uh, Dr. Fisher, and asked him that central question why did we lose an entire generation of men? 
I mean, it was such a heartbreak because they went into that war almost rejoicing and with yeah. all this sense of honor and nobility to fight for England and uh, the motherland. And they were stuck um, in a trench. And they were murdered uh, in a way that was so regrettable. And so the whole nation was just in mourning, and they still are, really, and, and they should be. But Dr. Fisher studied all of this, the strategy, mm -hmm. the vision, the tasks, the, you know, the, the government, the bureaucracy, human nature. And he said, you didn't, you didn't lose because you, you, you had some of the greatest, greatest fighting forces in the world. The, the, hmm. You had perfected Napoleonic warfare. Hmm. Your generals were great strategists. Um, your, um, your politicians were good politicians. Um, you, you lost a generation of men because you did not have vision. You saw gas as a weapon of war, but you did nothing about it. You saw the machine gun being developed, but you did nothing about it. You basically said, well, we'll still be fighting shoulder to shoulder because our courage will swarm any machine gun nest. And we'll just run through and hold our breath against the gas and our no. courage and our nobility will save us. They made these excuses yeah. because there was not in the political class other than Churchill, by mm -hmm. the way, who was sidelined and ostracized from politics because he was speaking against the narrative of the time. Hmm. Um, he was the only voice of vision, and he was thrown out because yeah. it was too provocative. England lost a generation of men because they did not have a political class that articulated a vision that was mindful of the technologies of the age. And I use that analogy because that describes where we're at as America right now. We can see these developments in space. And some people can see their implications, like Churchill did. He saw the implications of the airplane, yeah. of gas, of mechanization, of the machine gun. And he was screaming bloody murder in Parliament. Yeah. And he was thrown out on his ear <laughs> until they lost a generation. And they did not make that mistake because they brought Churchill back to be their prime minister before right. World War II. And he was the one that developed radar and the airplane mm. and, and won the Battle of Britain that was the tide that turned uh, the world uh, in a direction that eventually brought America in. Yeah. And uh, we won the war by paralyzing the German economy and the Japanese economy, mm. the paralyzation of the economy. Guess what space can do? Mm. It can paralyze our economy because it can turn out every light in every place with deliberate intent by an adversary, and we would literally not be able to produce the mechanisms to protect ourselves. Yeah. And they could do it at price points much less than we needed with air power and sea power to paralyze their shipping lanes and all that. That can all be done with space now with just a few satellites. So we are a nation that lacks vision yeah. The only question is whether we will lose a generation of men and women now mm -hmm. uh, because of this lack of vision or whether we will get a vision quickly enough to compete. Yeah. That is a sobering thought when you compare it to Battle, Battle of the Psalm and what those men went through. Yep. The, uh, I was on a plane ride recently and I watched that movie Darkest Hour where Churchill's coming through and he's talking to his cabinet and there's an incredible scene if people haven't seen it where he's because everyone in his cabinet is like we must sue for peace we must sue for peace we're getting destroyed we must sue for peace and in the most Churchilly way he just screams out at them you cannot reason with a tiger when your head is in its mouth that's right our head's not in China's mouth yet well, it's insidious. You know, China is s so subtle in their strategy, yeah. and uh, they are the indirect approach that this slow-growing vine that has been wrapping around the spinal cord of America economically, culturally, informationally, yep. uh, it, it may already we are, may already be in the mouth of the tiger, and the tiger is smart enough to make us think we're laying on a pillow. And, yeah. and they, he will close his jaws at a time of his own choosing. Hmm. Uh, we don't know that yet because, right. again, uh, reports and intelligence is always about a two-year delay. Hmm. But when you start painting the picture of what China is doing around the world and what they own in America, uh, you could make the case that we're already in the tiger's mouth. Yeah. 
Yeah. And the tiger has just chosen not to crush us because he would rather have this useless idiot <laughs> of a strong economy yeah. serve the Chinese people. Yeah, that's a very real possibility right there. And so, okay, so so going forward, right, if individual entrepreneurs, right, they can develop their own tactics towards power, communication, uh, energy, inf energy infrastructure development, which mm -hmm. will eventually come when those others do. The individual entrepreneur within the space realm can, can pursue that. The investors out there, they can choose to invest in those types of technologies because they understand the implications instead of just ESG backed bonds and such and such. Those can take those individual approaches. When it comes to just the, the average individual that doesn't have the disposable income to invest, that doesn't have, th that doesn't want to become an entrepreneur, what's their application to this? Is it, is it, let's, let's make sure we pay attention to our leaders when legislation comes into it? Is it, let's, uh, let's choose uh, the points that we agree upon with the people across the aisle? Because, because, right? If 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 the the virus, the spinal cord, we've been almost devoured by China here. If I'm not a politician, if I'm not an entrepreneur. What can I even do? Right. Well, um, this gets back to a point you made earlier that uh, I think is worth exploring now, and that is the power of the individual American in this constitutional construct of this republic that we're in, that we're in, <clears throat> and. Um, so these freedoms we've been given as American people are most powerful when we take the time to teach our children, or you can say family, sure. uh, these um, historical patterns of uh, civilizations, meaning that we are a civilization that has been uh, unique in history in our Constitution, taking the Magna Carta to the next level. Hmm. And it has produced a prosperity and a security and a, um, a happiness quotient that uh, is unrivaled. Hmm. Um, and um, we, we need to teach our children that you need to pay attention to the policies of your politicians, and you need to pay attention to the outcomes of um, your government's activities uh, and that is enough, hmm. meaning that if somebody chooses a bad leader, that happens on occasion. But when you see the results that that leader is producing, yeah. you fire them yeah. and you bring somebody else in. When you see a politician um, enacting a policy that is inconsistent with our values as Americans, you vote them out of office. Yeah. And you make sure that the voting system is honest and fair and it's one citizen, one vote. That's okay. You'll be able to edit that out. So, um, so you, you know, so you, you, you teach your children to start paying attention in a way we really haven't done since World War II. In other words, we have been so unilaterally um, successful as a country, economically, politically, culturally, that uh, the American people have pretty much had a blind faith and trust in our government that they'll do good things. And all we have to do is just get up, have our cup of coffee, go to work, come home, have a beer, go to bed, yeah. uh, rinse and repeat. Um, that is an anomaly of history. And so has the economic um, fortunes of America. That's an anomaly of history. I think that anomaly is something that can be perpetuated mm -hmm. <clears throat> because of our Constitution if we start teaching our children what's going on. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, but the fact that we have taken our eye off the ball of education, just take a look at what our children are being taught. Yep. Um, and you start seeing that they are not being taught these principles of the Constitution. Uh, they are being taught things that are antithetical, actually, to what we believe as Americans, or at least what we are founded on, our economy and our, right. um, and our uh, faith, one nation under God. Um, and they, uh, the education system has turned God into a bad word, yeah. and they've uh, divided. And whenever you see people dividing, whether it's China or politicians, hmm. that is a sign of tearing down what was built up. 
And uh, Western civilization in America have uplifted the human condition to such a degree, it's just not even funny. So yeah. th this is what the average American can do that doesn't want to get involved in politics. They need to realize that they, they will lose their freedom hmm. and their security if they do not teach their children and their families and their communities to pay attention to the policies of their politicians and measure them against their values hmm. and vote to put them out of office if they're not consistent yeah. and pay attention to what the federal government is doing. And if you don't want to like what they're doing, you vote them out of office and you hold your congressmen and your senators accountable. Yeah. If every American just started doing that, that civic duty, uh, we could turn this around pretty quick. Hmm. But as Reagan said, we are only one generation away of losing our freedoms and we are, we are falling prey to what we know is true, and that is education of the youth is the key to the kingdom of the future. Yeah. And because we have not held our teachers accountable to that, and our Board of Education, and the Department of Education, and curriculum is doing things like teaching children that their parents have no right to talk to them about whether they're a boy or a girl, that they get to decide that at age five or 10, yeah. um, is so antithetical to everything we believe as a society. That's how far it's gotten. So we need to take this back. And so yeah. individuals, your family, your neighborhood, your community, Mm -hmm. These are where you pay attention and you hold your politicians accountable. Otherwise, we are a country where we have um, ceded responsibility and authority to the government instead of what the Constitution said. The government only serves us. Yeah. We do not serve it. And when they're telling us um, you can't get credit because we don't like what you're saying, <laughs> you know, that is government controlling what you think and telling you what to think. And uh, it will kill this country if we don't take it back. Yeah. Well, I mean, near the end of that, you brought up just responsibility, right? It, if, it's, if it's the government, if it's your politician's responsibility to, to serve the individual such and such, and you want them to act in a responsible manner for the state, the federal, the local, the such, it really does come down to the individual. My brother and I have been talking about this of Daniel was like, okay, what is, what's the base unit? What's the, is, is the individual the most valuable unit or is it the collective? And if you believe that it's the individual, then, then you uniquely matter. And if you uniquely matter, then whenever you're in life, you need to be able to negotiate as if you matter, which is, hard to do and a lot of us don't do that that's a learned skill to actually fight for ourselves in a lot of areas <laughs> and i think the way you gain right if you want to affect your community and your family you gain that by fixing your own crap first yeah and having this conversation uh, because both are important the individual is the source of power but when you can align individuals based on belief and values then they act as a collective and yeah. you don't have to coordinate or communicate because you're talking about values. You're talking yeah. about belief. That's the beauty of the power of the individual where, um, just having these conversations, what do you believe? Hmm. And then what are the values that derive out of the belief? Because it's those values that animate your politicians and the policies policy is powerful. Yeah. Okay. And all you have to do is have a conversation. Hey, did you see that our, um, city council voted to, pass this legislation or this regulation and you start talking about it and say well what does that mean hmm. for us and is that consistent with our values and what we believe hmm. and if it's not you march right into their office and say you need to overturn that law or we're throwing you out hmm. and and you organize and you talk and yeah. you know you don't have to be perfect but you have these conversations your neighbors, you know, yet we have been divided in the suburbs where yeah. you drive into your garage, you close the door, you're in your home. And how often do you see your neighbor? How often do you talk? Yeah. You know, that's one reason why I took this job as the HOA president of this place is oh, to, nice. uh, you know, just talk to the neighbors. But, uh, you know, again, all of us need to learn new habits in yeah. this regard because we have been, um, I don't know, we've been uh, lulled into a sense of false security that all we have to do is worry about ourselves hmm. and not talk to other people. 
and uh, we can go along living because our, our government is going to take care of things. And what they end up doing is taking control of things. And now you rely on the government for your food supply chain. You rely on the government for your water supply chain. You rely yep. on your government for your transportation. You Dude. rely on the government. You know, it goes on and on. Your energy, your information. Yep. And uh, yikes, you know. So we got we got to be careful. We're in a dangerous place as a country, yeah. uh, but uh, not without hope if yeah. we get back to the basics. Well said. So the space conversation is about an escape valve to a new <laughs> a new optimism. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you get these secular slowdowns where everything feels like it's constrained and it's getting worse, you need a breakout. Hmm. Space can be the breakout for humanity to start breathing again and, uh, and for America to throw the shackles off of government that's oppressive and has gotten too much control. But we need a president with a vision yes. and the ability to articulate it and then choose leaders in the bureauc bureaucratic government to release the full potential of the, bureaucratic, or of the economic class of entrepreneurs in the free market of America. That'll light a fire on hmm. the global market in a way that will change the world and uplift the human condition. That's why space is so important. That's why this conversation is so powerful. Dude. It is, this, it is, in my opinion, and has been since I was a uh, college student studying astronautics and, uh, and understanding what the power of that technology could do. I said to myself, even in college, um, this will either save America, or if America ignores it, it will be the downfall of America. Yeah. So on that last point there of it, it incentivizing those individual entrepreneurs, we touched on this earlier. Tell us some more about, about Genesis Technologies. Like where did that birth from? And Well, Dr. David Stuckenberg is the, uh, uh, the, the genius that really, um, you know, he is like most national security professionals. He really pays attention to the trend lines of history. Hmm. And what he was watching is he was watching as he was flying combat missions over, um, the Middle East. He was watching the Middle East draw its last natural aquifer water out to water palm trees. Hmm. And now they were totally dependent on diesel out of the Arabian Gulf wow. that was killing the, the ocean and killing the landfill because it creates such pollution and toxic uh, really? salty water. Yeah, it's totally unsustainable as a solution for water. Plus, you can't, you know, the pipes to carry it inland, you can't get to the central India or other places that aren't by the ocean. So it's, uh, he was watching this and he said, we've yeah. got to find a solution for humanity to draw a different source of water. And he brought together the engineers and started this company that have basically invented a water generator that can affordably draw water out of the humidity in the air for all your needs. And it can do it with any power source, solar, geothermal, electricity, wind, wave, you know, it, it's low intensity power. Low intensity power. Yeah. So it, um, it will. So you just need time. Right. To, to, right, to yeah. get a large quantity. Right. So, for example, the household unit, uh, if you, uh, you know, if you need uh, hundreds of gallons a day, you can have one that's the size of your air conditioner. If hmm. you need thousands of gallons a day, you can have one the size of a half a shipping container, 20 by 8 by 8. If you need hundreds of millions of gallons a day, you have one kind of like the size of the water towers in your hometown. Um, that can draw water out of the humidity in, in the air. And the beautiful thing about Mother Nature, God created the world where when you bring humidity out of the air, Mother Nature replenishes it within minutes. <laughs> it is the perfect sustainable source of water. And we've never tapped into it as human race. Uh. And air conditioning and dehumidifiers do the job, but it, uh, air is such a good insulator, it's always too expensive. It's like four gallons of diesel fuel for one gallon of water. <laughs> We use a liquid desiccant, meaning, meaning a liquid-to-liquid -liquid process like the ocean does. Most people don't realize the ocean not only is a source of evaporation, okay. but the ocean absorbs water out of the air to balance the humidity in the global water system. And huh. so it's a liquid desiccant. It's attracted to water osmotically and passively, no energy required. And that's what we tap into. Okay. We, we basically mimic the ocean and mother nature, but we can design the chemical makeup of our non-toxic fluid to be 20,000 times more efficient than the ocean because we don't uh, have to have fish living in it, but God <laughs> needed fish. Right, right, right. We need fish. So it is the perfect sustainable That's solution deep. to a water source. So we call it the water cube because okay. around you, there's a cube of air, 29 feet by 29 feet by 29 feet or 10 by 10 by 10 meters. Hmm. In that cube 
is all the water you need. There is that much water hanging in the air at any one time, and you don't even realize it. I drink a lot of water. Good. <laughs> so now, uh, it, because when you fly over the oceans, 70% of the earth is water. Oh, yeah. But only 1% of that water is drinkable. We, yeah. We've always waited for it to rain before we took our drink. Okay, whether it's an aquifer, a river, a lake, or a stream. Okay. Now, you can have a water cube that can draw the water out of the air affordably using green energy, yeah. and you can have it anywhere on the planet you want. Because if there's water in the air, it can be drawn out affordably, and Mother Nature will replenish it within minutes. What's the linchpin of this technology? Like this, it's, it's the liquid. The um, liquid desiccant. Right. And the reason this was not affordable in years past is right. just the same reason why Elon Musk uh, couldn't make reusable rockets back in the 80s. Okay. It's because supercomputing and uh, some of the other technologies needed to evolve in okay. order. Or like why Steve Jobs couldn't make the smartphone back in 82. Sure. He had to wait for the internet to be robust, and then the smartphone could work. Okay. The same was true here. It was actually the battery industry. Um, billions and billions of dollars of the battery industry put into liquid-to-liquid uh, liquid processes where you could design a special cocktail of a molecular structure of a liquid called a nanofluid or ionic fluid. Okay. We just took that, those billions and billions of dollars of worth of research, and we applied it to drawing water out of the air. Huh. using a liquid to liquid process. And so we, we and we were the first company to have that patented and granted in the US and overseas. So now we're just commercializing that technology. But it um, 5 years ago it was between 10 and $20,000 to just design 1 ounce of an ionic fluid huh. and now you can do it for less than a penny an ounce because of what the battery industry did to make more efficient batteries. So we benefit just like Elon Musk did wow. or, uh, you know, Steve Jobs. Yeah. We benefited from all of that and we applied it to a useful and novel problem. And that is yeah. water scarcity yeah, where yeah. most people in the world, 2.1 billion people on this planet, planet do not have enough water. 50% of illnesses are caused by dirty water and 6,000 children will die today because of a lack of water. We applied that technology in the Western world to this problem that exists in other parts of the world. Yeah. And is coming to America. Look at the Southwest. Uh, California yeah. right now. In Ventura County, they've restricted you to 30 gallons of water a day. That's oh, not man. enough to take a shower, water your lawn, uh, wash your car, and uh, do your laundry, and, uh, you know, and, and, wow. and cook and drink. You have to make choices. So now you let your lawn die, which, you know, you can, you can solve the problem through austerity. <laughs> Only take one shower a month. Okay. <laughs> Never do laundry, you know? Yeah. Uh, you, you know, You'll you have, create you other have, problems. You have choices, but you create other problems. Yeah. But you have this abundant source all around you right now, all the time. And you're not tapping into it. Genesis Systems taps into it for you. What's, what's the power requirements on these guys? Well, so that's a journey. You know, the very first one we built, you know, yeah. like the first automobile or the first airplane, was clunky, expensive, a little inefficient. Sure. But we are just, uh, you know, leaps and bounds on efficiency. So you ask me today, and I can give you an answer on how many kilowatt hours per gallon. Fair. But tomorrow, it'll be half that. So <laughs> the first one we made, uh, you know, the second one made twice as much water with half the energy. Wow. And the third generation twice as much water with half the energy oh, and in smaller sizes. So we are on a journey to be smaller, lighter, and more efficient. Okay. And soon we will be the cheapest source of water on planet Earth. I believe that. I, our engineers are on that path. But that, again, like anything else, it takes time. Sure. And this is a mindset shift, you know? Yeah. We've always lived where there was water because we had to. Now mm -hmm. you can live anywhere. You can, this is a platform for civilization. You can live on, uh, in the Gobi Desert or on the top of uh, a, a, a desolate mountain with no water source, and you can have abundant water to grow food, to drink, and to have beautiful plants around you. And vegetation right there. Yeah. It's great. It's really fun, and I'm having a blast. How old is this company? It's only a few years old. Are you guys still like in the, the raising funding Yeah, we, we, region, we, we've been in stealth mode until last fall. And okay. then we kicked off our first operational product uh, that, by the way, the Port of San Antonio, Texas, has mm. purchased on their journey to become water independent and sustainable. 
The port. Um, yeah, Port San Antonio. That's probably the most innovative part of San Antonio. But they work with the, the mayor and the city, yeah. so it's part of the governance of uh, San Antonio. And uh, but we kicked off that first unit last fall. Uh, but yeah, we're we've uh, we're startup of the year. Uh, we are across the country. We are we oversubscribed our seed series by three hundred percent. We are now doing our Series A, and uh, it's going. Ga- so we basically have grown like gangbusters through COVID. That yeah. shows you the power of a good idea yeah. that's useful. Golly. So wait. So so two questions there. One of an aside. You said the San Antonio port is trying to become water independent. Do do ports? like use a, a large amount of water just in their transportation well, or ev- uh, so I guess ev- I don't understand that comment. So everything uses water, but what San Antonio is, they're trying to be sustainable. Yeah. Okay. And they're trying to be resilient okay. right now. Our power grid is not resilient. No. Our water systems are not resilient. Hmm. So what kicked this off is a storm that hit San Antonio where they lost water for days. Yeah. People in five star hotels that. down by the river walk were taking their champagne buckets and going down to the river walk to flush the toilets. So um, they so this gives them sustainable water that's resilient I see, because I see. the water can be made as long as there's air, you know, <laughs> and Hope that stays and, around. Right. So that should be around for a while. Yeah. Right? Um, and uh, so the city is be, very, very forward thinking. And okay. um, uh, so they're one of our gateway cities, you know, yeah. but every everything has a water footprint. The shirt you wear about four to six hundred gallons to make that shirt. The cell phone that rang earlier, 3,100 gallons to make that cell phone. The data center that Ooh. is cooling the data that that cell phone is using, millions of gallons a day. Coca-Cola takes 406 gallons for one gallon of Coke. <laughs> and they steal it from drinking water sources. And the drinking water sources are now saying no. The brewery in California that takes 5,000 gallons to make the beer, the government of California basically said, no, you only get 300 gallons now. <laughs> they can't make a living, so they're buying one of our systems so they can make air beer. Let's go. So th- all wow. of this, every product line, pharmaceuticals, um, you know, emergency hospitals for backup water generators. Yeah. You know, so the government can never say, hey, you only get 30 gallons today. You can say, no, I can take more because I'm not stealing it from any condensed water source and Mother Nature replenishes it within minutes. It's the perfect air well. Because wells are going an dry, well. and it's an air well. Oh, that's got to be trademarked if it isn't. Our, like, oh. So, yeah, there's got so many applications here. You can go the, so I guess the San Antonio one, that was like shipping container size yeah. or larger? Yep, okay. for starters. I mean, they'll, they'll go larger. That yeah. You know, they want to start small. Ranches in Texas, ranches right. in California, wineries, breweries. Um, again, the water footprint of everything man creates that's useful to another person requires water okay so getting into the finances you said the seed round gangbusters oh yeah uh, naturally yeah series a right now what are you guys trying to raise we're raising 50 million we we could okay. raise more uh, we'll probably oversubscribe we oversubscribe by 300 percent on our seed series and there's, right. the series a is going the same way meaning that there's um a lot of people that are really smart that look at our technology. The Air Force Research Lab has validated our technology. Nice. Uh, they, we've let them look under the hood at everything because we trust them. And uh, most of our federally funded research labs have been infiltrated by China. So we don't trust all of them because the moment you share something with a federally funded research lab, it shows up in Chinese markets. So uh, we are very careful of that. So Air, Force Re- Air Force Research Lab has been one of the best at protecting their intellectual property. So the, the distinction there, just because, right, I don't work with research labs, and so they all kind of sound similar. So define, so Air Force Research Lab versus federally funded yeah, versus so federally funded, Marine funded? Yeah, so or? the federally funded are like the Sandia, uh, Livermore Labs, Lincoln Labs up at MIT. Okay. Um, those, uh, the, so there's, um, the, the, now the Air Force Research Lab is technically federally funded because it's run on the Air Force money. But um, uh, they are in a different camp than the the technical FFRDCs. Gotcha. Okay. So it just in as in the same way as ITAR probably isn't perfect. Right. And the Air Force Research Center probably isn't perfect. Yeah. At keeping out technology going over to China because right. of their. But, but, but we needed delays. somebody. We needed somebody with credentials to validate our technology. Tracking. And uh, and again, we're gonna 
be the best in the world, not because we yeah. can built a, a Fort Knox around our IP. It's because we're moving fast. And on this journey of relentlessly pursuing lower energy in, higher volumes of water out in a container that's smaller, lighter, and more portable uh, is our gold standard. And we are um, years ahead of anybody else in this, in this realm. Yeah. So if people want to invest in that, you said, you know. Yeah, Genesis Systems, we're an LLC. Genesis Systems Global. There okay. is another Genesis Systems that's a robotics company. But okay. you'll, you'll know. Find the one with water. Genesis <laughs> Systems Global. And, it's, and our website is genesissystems.global, not .com. Got it. So uh, that's another way of discriminating us because we are a global, global company. And our mission is to solve global water uh, scarcity sustainably. So no pollution, yeah, and uh, and using green energy. Yeah, that's that's an exciting problem to tackle. I think about uh, Simon Sinek wrote a book, uh, Start with Why. That's right. And one of the things I pulled out of that was he gives all these examples of the companies that really make an impact. Their their gold standard, their metric is something infinitely beyond their tiny little network. Yep, and what was the example it was from japan it was, it was i think it was toyota I, I i'm gonna go with that if i'm wrong someone will correct but it was when toyota was first being built before this japan was just known as throwaway cheap plastic you know whatever there's the uh what is it back to the future there's the reference of like oh made in japan oh, it must be trash and let's say it was toyota i believe it was they came in and said we want to make Japan known for quality. And it was an insane statement because it was so much larger than themselves and they ballooned into a massive company. I think it, it, when you tackle huge challenges like that, not only does it push you to have insane goals, insane metrics, but it also has everyone else go, wait, so you, you, want, to, you want to solve water? For, for everyone, uh, it, the eyebrows definitely go up at that. Yeah, well, we do something else that's pretty interesting, and uh, I'll send you a video. But uh, Please. Um, our process is unique in the sense that uh, it also pulls CO2 out of the air as part of the process. So now you're pulling two greenhouse gases okay. out of the air. And think about that, what that does. Uh, you know, CO2 is basically a fertilizer for food growth. So it's a good way to say that. Yeah. yeah. So if, for example, if you have a tomato plant in a greenhouse and it's growing in normal air, which is 400 parts per million CO2, it grows at a normal rate. If you increase the parts per million of CO2 to 1200 parts per million, that tomato grows at 20 times the rate, 20 times, not 20% more, but 20 X. Um, now, uh, so one small greenhouse can grow food 20 times that same acreage. And our so water generator food. can you know, pump water and CO2 into that in a responsible way where you can grow more food with less water and less acreage. And so now, you know, you're not just solving water scarcity, you're solving food. hunger. And it can be placed anywhere, anywhere. You can place it in a place where there's no standing water and no power grid, no infrastructure. The tribe I grew up in Africa. Yeah. Place one of these air wells and you have a platform for civilization to grow up because you have food, you have water, and abundance. And as you said, the power cost is just getting less and less and less. It and is. I mean, we're it, and and again, it depends. You know, when you try to capture the cost of energy, it depends on a lot of things. It depends sure. on the market you're in and the type of. So, for example, if you power it with solar panels, mm -hmm. we're less than one kilowatt hour per gallon. Hmm. Uh, and, and, and the more, the larger, you, and it, it scales in a way that is unique. It's not linear, meaning the okay. more water we make, so the larger the container, mm -hmm. like a city sized water plant, the less energy per gallon. Nice. Nice. So we're well below a penny a gallon in the large units. Wow. And, uh, but again, if you use electricity, it's a little more, if you use solar, it's a little less. Yeah. So it depends on what type of energy you choose. And that's right. why we call it water your way. You tell me where you live and I'll do the environmental study of how much humidity is there across a year, uh -huh. but you tell me where you live and how much water you need each day and what kind of energy you want to power it. And I can build you a water well for your place, an air well. 
So yeah. it's pretty exciting. Yeah, I'm 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 just kind of just in awe and shock of that kind of technology. I definitely need to to dig into that more and. Well, this, like I, I said, this is how we will manage water in space travel. Right. That's because what I'm you, trying you to tell get me, to. you tell me how many families you want to uh, live for how long? Three hundred years. Sure. I can tell you exactly how much dirt and how much <laughs> water you need, and I will be able to put it into a closed loop system yep. in a spaceship that gives you one g gravity, protection of all radiation, mm. and the ability to grow food and drink water indefinitely. So, so. Okay, so the so in that example that you just gave us, someone else needs to build the uh, the infrastructure of the actual ship, sure. right? The manufacturing, yeah. But plenty of people are are working towards that. You bet the asteroid mining, and then the ability to take that mining and three D print in yeah. space. That is off to the races. All the space companies that are doing that yeah. are really fun to watch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So then the the soil. So, yeah, I guess we'll go Astro- there. Asteroid is the same dirt as, as on planet Earth. Hmm. You know? It doesn't have the organics, though. So those have to be introduced. Correct. But like you're saying, the base minerals mm-hmm. on an asteroid are the exact same as... That's right. Yeah, it's not hard to uh, create the dirt you need to grow food. Huh. You just need to have the contained atmosphere. You need to have maybe, you know, large, large quantities of water. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of water in space, and you can <laughs> yeah. collect it as you go, too. I mean, the amount of water in space is really one of those things people don't realize. Every asteroid, the moon, I mean, it's like uh, having uh, three of the Great Lakes combined in the ice, you know, in the volcanic uh, southern, you know, pole of the moon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, but space is filled with water. Okay. Filled with water. Especially when you go like further out to the asteroid belt and then sure. way further well, there out. Are, yeah, there are you know, moons just just made out of nothing but ice. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. So I'm. I'm. There's questions in my head that want to talk about sure. future strategy. Yeah. So but, again, this is where it's fun to talk about those things. Uh, but all you need is the sun, yeah. or a sun, <laughs> and right. and Earth. Yeah. And the human. Uh, species can thrive Hmm. and you can create environments that are beautiful and peaceful and secure you know it's we are only limited by our imagination but we have the tools this is this is that moment where humanity can actually uh, uh, make escape velocity and the business case actually closes but right now um, we're in a little competition with another civilization that's trying to get there first Yep. They see it as their national vision. They have the money and the geniuses chasing it. They do. Um, and the only question is whether we will employ our secret weapon, mm-hmm. which is called free will and uh, the free market, uh, to leapfrog ahead of our competition, not to beat them, mm-hmm. but to make sure our values uh, create yeah. the rule of law in the space economy. Yeah, and it's... I think that's an aspect that's really important to to hark on. And it's like, it's, it's not that we want to win for the sake of winning. Right. It's that, no, no, no. The values that this nation is founded upon. (laughs) I mean, you, you look at the spread of democracy across the world and no, it's not perfect everywhere. It's made up with humans. And yeah, there's some corruption here and there. Absolutely. A lot less than in other places when democracy is not involved, but it, it get it's the only government that we've made that, that untaps that resource of go be creative on this. Go be creative. I was on a, um, a, a date like a couple months ago and the end result of it was that, you know, we weren't, we weren't in the right place, you know, whatever, both of us not going to work out. Sure. Fine and dandy. But one of the things that I gathered from that is, okay, if your mind is only focused on this thing, thing right in front of you because life is crazy then it's really difficult for you to ask interesting questions about this other thing because your stress and such and such and your mind is so focused on and i think the american people are often focused on the day-to-day the tiktoks the the short attention span aspects the ability of democracy to say hey i'm 
I'm going to untap your freedoms and whatever you want to focus on, whatever, whatever business idea really keeps you up at late at night. I love water. I think it's super important. I've always thought someone else is going to figure that out. And we have, and, and you have, yeah. right? Yeah. But it's, uh, I love the fact that it blends two of my passions because it yeah. will be what Elon Musk uses as a water management system going to Mars uh, in time, and it solves a terrestrial problem that I grew up with, and I feel deeply in my in my heart. It's personal. Yeah, just the. <sighs> yeah, it's fun. So this is so, why I'm grateful for you and this podcast because it helps have these conversations and in ways that are more digestible than a, a, a ticker or a, a meme. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, and I think the other thing, and 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 this will be be where so we wrap it up, is. Right. The, what we talked about today is what can I do as an individual who's just listening in on this education? Yeah. Pay attention. Pay attention to these types of conversations. There's so many companies, Exhibit A, and plenty others that we're going to have here on the show that are doing incredible things to push humanity forward. Just, just pay attention and yeah. you'll see them. That's right. And teach your family. Yes. To pay attention to these things and hold your politicians accountable and to make sure that every decision they make is consistent with the Constitution, mm -hmm. the freedoms we've been given, and that they only do what the government has been asked to do, and that is provide for the common security. Everything else should be the local responsibility. Mm. Education uh, so uh, is one of them. Uh, and uh, we've just... We've, we've just uh, been lazy at letting our government take control of every aspect of our lives and now we're stuck with essentials that we have to rely on the government and it's only a matter of time that some evil person will use that as a weapon against us or as a uh, tactic for blackmail yeah uh, and uh, we can't let that happen we yeah. can't lose what has been fought and died for so on this uh, day after the 4th of July our Independence Day it's fun to visit with you about this. And, uh, and for me, um, I'm waiting for that president that has the right vision mm -hmm. and then picks the right leaders to unleash the full potential of the American spirit. And then watch out. The great giant will be awakened and we will uplift the human condition and usher humanity into the economy of space that will allow us to turn uh, this world into a park with no pollution. Hmm. And... Uh, that was uh, Jeff Bezos that said that many years ago, but yeah. uh, it's true. I love it. I can't think of a better note to end on than that. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for hosting me in your home. Well, thank you. No, it means a lot to me. I appreciate it. And good luck. And uh, I'll f feed you other people that can have many other conversations like these. Uh, be awesome. That can go down every uh, intellectual curiosity that we have as a human race. Fantastic. We'll get some, some links out to the website in the description okay. for people uh, so they can invest there. And uh, yeah, at Astra, everyone, keep dreaming and uh, go look at the blue sky. It's pretty out there. Thank you all for tuning into the show. We appreciate your flexibility for this episode being only the audio version and re-released that way. We're currently in the middle of expanding our operational team to allow for better video quality for all of the viewers out there. If you're interested in joining the team, reach out to me. And if you enjoyed the show, we would really appreciate you leaving a review on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you are looking at this and you know, sharing it with your network. That really helps a lot. If you want to reach out directly, you can find me on all of the social medias at jvincent. Maroli, name in the description. It kind of sounds like my favorite Italian dessert, cannolis. So, you know, that, that just seems fitting to me. <laughs> if you want to be a guest on the show, reach out to me. Email jvincent at cislunarconsulting.com and we can begin that discussion. Or, you know, just hit me up on LinkedIn. That always works too. And to everyone else out there, Today seemed a little dark. Our apologies, but it's a necessary part of the space conversation. 
But the good news is, there's hope. Not only in individuals taking on personal responsibility, cleaning up their own stuff, and holding their elected officials accountable, but there's a hope that goes beyond mere kings or presidents. I found that hope in the incredible love of Jesus Christ. It's written, God is our refuge and strength and never present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Psalm 46, 1-3 through three. We will not fear. Go in peace and be not afraid.